about our technical um, supports. All right, so Dr. Balms, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mindy. And I'm sorry, I can't be in person uh, up in uh, the CR room in Sacramento. Uh, I look forward to our next consultation group meeting being in person and for me to see you again in, in person. Um, I have to teach at Berkeley this afternoon. I don't know if Luis Almedo is on, uh, is either in person or uh, on the Zoom, but Luis has actually taught in this class before. Uh, and uh, I really couldn't miss it today. Um, but I was, I'm very pleased to say that uh, in the room, you can see her, uh, my fellow board member, Davina Hurt, uh, council member uh, of uh, uh, Belmont in the peninsula and a Bay Area Air Quality Management District member and board member for the district, car board member for the district, uh, who uh, I've already, over the last year or so, uh, got, real, got to know her and to realize how much of an ally she is for um, an equity lens in all the CARB uh, regulatory actions. And I think uh, you'll be pleased that she will be able to chair in my absence uh, today, uh, the consultation group. And you know, so please give her um, all the respect and attention you give to me, uh, if not more so. And uh, I'm actually coming back for the last hour, uh, but I'm going to be in the background. I don't want to take away from uh, the flow of uh, the, the group's discussions on chapters five and six. And I just really want to thank everybody for continued participation as we go through the People's Blueprint. Uh, and uh, I wish you a good couple hours, and then I'll come back and join you at the end. So, Davina. Is it my turn? Thank you, Dr. Balms. Uh, I, I appreciate the warm welcome. Um, as you said, I'm uh, the secretary of the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, chair of the uh, Community Equity, Health, and Justice Committee, sit on CARB, and I'm extremely passionate about the work that all of you are doing. Um, you know, igniting lasting change that can be replicated throughout the state and just building back uh, better communities based upon all of your lived experiences um, is really key. So I'm happy to fill these big shoes of Dr. Balms and, uh, and happy to pass it back over to Mindy. Thank you and welcome board member Hurt. Uh, so I'd like to turn it over to Liliana to do roll call. And Liliana, if you would have folks differentiate between uh, whether they're remote or in the room, that'd be great. Awesome. Hello, can you hear me? Great. Um, so we have Christine Zimmerman in for, um, in, oh, no, we don't. Sorry, we have um, Kathy Reese Boyd. And she let me know that she's having issues um, Joining, so we'll get back to that. Deidre Sanders. Uh, Erica Manuel. Manuel. And Liliana, we can't hear if they're here or not. So if you would just say. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I didn't hear from Deidre Sanders. She's not in the room here. Um, Erica Erica's Manuel. on the Zoom. Awesome. Thank you, Erica. Um, Gustavo. I think Gustavo might be in the attendees. He is trying to get in. Um, so Veronica Eady. Yes, present. Hi, Veronica. Jana Ganyan. Yes, present and by Zoom. Thank you, Jana. Um, Christine Wolf. She is here in the room. Um, Jesse Marquez. Jesse Marquez, present in the room. Um, Dr. Bombs, we've heard from him. I'm present for now, but <laughs> soon to be leaving. And hi, Luis, I did see that you're there and today is the day I would have you, but I'm having a me Raval instead because I knew you were busy. Uh, did I take your chair? <laughs> <laughs> awesome, so uh, Kevin Hamilton. He is not in the room and does not seem to be on Zoom yet. 
um, Luis Olmedo is here in person. Um, we have Paula Torado Plazas for PSRLA here. Um, Dr. Michael Jarrett is not here. Um, Dr. Kleiman. I am here. Here via Zoom. Um, Ms. Margaret. Present. Here in person. Um, Dr. Paul English is not here, um, not via Zoom. Um, Dr. Uh, Jenny Quintana, she let me know she wasn't going to be here, so I'd be surprised. Um, Roger Isom, uh, not in person and doesn't appear to be on Zoom. Um, Samir Sheikh, or Ryan. Uh, Liliana, I'm uh, representing the. I knew I saw you. I said uh, Samir today. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and Tung? Uh, here and uh, on Zoom. Zoom, thank you. Wait, I think Catherine Higgins is here for South Coast AQMD. Yes. Hi, Catherine. I'm here. Hello, I'm here and on Zoom. And Will Barrett, I see you. Hi, everybody. I'm Will Barrett here on Zoom. Thank you for joining. And that concludes roll call. Great. Thank you very much, Liliana. So now I'm going to turn it over to Abigail, and she's going to share a couple of remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mindy. Can everyone hear me OK? All right. Hello, my name is Abigail May. I'm a senior attorney with the Air Resources Board. And I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that this meeting is CARB's very first state body meeting with in-person and teleconference options for consultation group members and the public to participate since early 2020. So we're, we're really excited about that. So the, Bagley, uh, the executive order with Bagley Keene Act exemptions is ending, and though it has some ambiguities during this immediate transition period as the entire state returns to in-person meetings, ideally we would have a quorum in person today. And going forward, we're working to have a quorum in person in one location or establishing several physical locations which consultation group members can participate from that would be open to the public. So today's meeting is fully transparent. We have both the teleconference and in-person options for the public to address consultation group members. And also, as you know, this is an advisory group meeting. So there's no formal action taken today. There are no votes on the agenda for the consultation group. And, and lastly, I just want to acknowledge, I know that everyone has different levels of comfort and risk and ability to travel as we transition to in-person meetings. So I just want to say that I appreciate and want to acknowledge all the dedication and hard work of staff, of the facilitation team, and the consultation group members themselves to prepare for this important discussion today. So with that, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your participation today. And I look forward to the discussion. So thank you. Back to Mindy. And this is Kathy Reyes Boyd. I did was able to just get on. So can you see and hear me OK? We can. Thank okay. you. Great. Thank you for trying. <laughs> Did anybody um, else come in since we started roll call? Yes, how's it going? This is Gustavo Aguirre Jr. with Central California Environmental Justice Network. Thank you. And Gustavo, are you? Okay, yes, you're, you're remote. Okay, great, you're virtual. All right. Anybody else? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Brian uh, to give us our tech orientation. Thank you, Brian. Well, uh, thanks, Mindy. And like Abigail, I am excited that we're all here in the room and a little nervous. So we'll see how this goes um, as we work out the kinks. I appreciate uh, all your patience. So we do have consultation group members uh, and the public participating remotely on Zoom and in person at the North Cal EPA headquarters building in the Sierra room. Um, the consultation group members are encouraged to participate in both settings. The public has been invited and will be participating either in person or virtually as well. Well, so soon, we already hold, held roll call. Um, directions for those participating remotely. Um, you'll be able to see our in-person members on camera in the tile that's named CG Sierra Room. You'll see the group up there sitting. Facilitators, facilitators will make sure participation will be shared between those in-person and those attending virtually. Uh, due to the complexity of this new hybrid meeting, uh, the chat function is disabled for the meeting. 
Consultation group members will see they are called panelists. What this means is that they have the ability to be on video. Public attendees do not know. This will help to focus this as a consultation group meeting conversation with public observers and commenters. To participate remotely, consultation group members can use the raised hand feature to be placed in the speaking queue. Um, we appreciate you staying on mute until it's your turn to speak to be respectful of everyone's turn. When it's your turn to speak, the facilitators will call out your name so you may uh, unmute yourself. We encourage you to use your video so that the attendees can see you. For remote uh, public participants, as also known as attendees, we will be able to raise your hands remotely during the public comment period. When it is your turn, the host will ask you to unmute. After you push the unmute button, you may begin to speak. Here we will show you where you can find the raise your hand feature and how the host will ask you to unmute. So now on to the in-room orientation. Um, regarding COVID guidance, attendees not vaccinated are asked to wear a mask. For those vaccinated, masks are optional. Restrooms are out the double doors and around to the left, and the main exit is out the double doors and straight to the staircase on the right. Uh, participation. For consultation group members that are in person to participate, you can now actually raise your actual hand up high and I will see you, and I'll make sure to take down your name uh, and get you in the queue to speak. Um, when it's your turn to speak, uh, I will call out your name. Uh, we request and, re request and appreciate that you provide your feedback about chapter five and only six today. For the public here in person today, if you'd like to comment, we have placed, or just please raise your hand and we will also get you in a queue uh, for the public comment period. And just for everyone uh, in-house and on Zoom, we are recording this meeting for posting to our website um, and you can feel free to be on camera or not. Thanks, and back, back to you, Mindy. Thank you for that, Brian. So before we proceed, are there any questions regarding the technical aspects of our meeting? Um, I do want to let you know right now, you can see that Corin, uh, his phone number is available. You can call or text him and he will help you. As you can see, I'm waving. All right, great. So let's go ahead and jump into preparing for the meeting, talking about our purpose and our agenda. Let's lay our table. So we can go ahead and advance to the next slide. Um, oh yeah, go ahead. We have a question in the CR room. We're not hearing anything. I think we're okay. We're just going over the protocol in-house to ask questions. I think we're okay. Also, so, why don't you let so, me know when you're ready to move right, on? Right. Just one more time for all. The consultation group members here, you can actually raise your physical hand when, they, when you want to make a comment, and I'll kind of give you a thumbs up and let you know that I've seen you, and I'll put you in a queue here, and then I'll call your name once I let Mindy know we have questions. Yeah, I apologize. It's a little, little laborious, but hopefully it'll work out. And every consultation group member should remember that when they're ready to speak and they're called on, they need to push the little green mic light in front of them. Okay, great. Thank you for that reminder, Delty. Anything else before we move on? Okay, I'm not hearing anything, so I'm going to move us along. So as both Abigail and Brian have said, this is a hybrid meeting. It's our very first time with this approach. Um, so we hope everything goes perfectly, but um, you know, and there's been a lot of energy to put to set this up and make sure that it flows smoothly. Um, but you know, life is life. So if we do hit any road bumps, uh, we just ask for your patience and your flexibility. All right, so now let's turn to what brings us here today. So welcome to the AD 617 consultation group meeting. Uh, today, our purpose is for the consultation group members and the CARB OCAP staff to share their questions and comments about chapters five and six. Um, and the discussions we have today will significantly inform the development of the pro program blueprint. Uh, we also hope to get comments from the public as well. So let me walk you through the agenda. Um, so, oh, actually, let's go back to this. There we go. Yeah, let, let, let me walk through the agenda so you've got a sense of what we're doing today. Um, so after I finish giving you sort of, like I said, laying out the table, um, we're going to recap the previous meeting outcomes. Uh, CARB's going to provide some updates. Uh, and we're going to talk to you about the people's blueprint review process and timeline so you have a sense of what's coming up. 
Uh, we're also then going to go to the meat of the meeting, which is discussions of the People's Blueprint, chapters five and chapter six. Uh, we're gonna first do chapter five. We'll have discussion with the consultation group members and CARB staff. And then once we wrap up that discussion, we'll transition to public comment. Uh, then we will go ahead and move on to chapter six. Uh, I see there's a hand up. I'm just gonna finish with the agenda and then I will go to the hand up in the room. Then we'll go to discussion, uh, the discussion for chapter six. We'll take comments from the consultation group members and CARB. And then once we finish that discussion, we'll move on to public comment. Uh, then there was an assessment that was sent out uh, that was done and we'll talk a little bit about that and take any comments that the group has on that and then we'll also then transition to the public comment and then we'll wrap up and I'll provide information on next steps. So I see a hand raised in the room. So Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you. Sure. Thanks, Mindy. Uh, Jesse Marquez, go ahead and uh, ask your question. It's all yours. Uh, yes, Jesse Marquez, Coalition for a Safe Environment in Wilmington, Los Angeles. Uh, we also received in our packet a document and it says Sacramento State <laughs> on it. And it was the Sacramento Uni Cal State University Sacramento College of Continuing Education. And it was a memorandum that was based, I guess, on some of the interviews that were done. Now, is that gonna be discussed at all in here on the agenda? Hi, so actually, if you look at the slide, uh, I'm sorry for the having the two different names. That's agenda item number eight. And that is that memo that we'll be talking about. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you for clarifying that, Jesse. Appreciate the question. Any other questions on the agenda? Okay, great. Um, so we can go ahead and go on to the next slide. So before we go into meeting agreements, I'm, I wanna talk about it a little bit differently. Um, a lot of times, you know, they're just listed, they're perfunctory, um, but I just wanna give you guys a, a different take on, on meeting agreements. And I wanna preface it by saying, we had a phenomenal meeting in January. And I wanna thank everybody who took part in it, uh, you know, for their uh, wonderful participation and engagement. It was really a fantastic meeting. Um, Sometimes when, you know, when we're in, in these meetings, the way that they're ultimately very successful is when we bring two things to the table. And I might be missing one, but uh, the two things that come to mind are we bring our brains and we bring our heart. And sometimes when we're having meetings and we're passionately engaged, it's, it's really easy to, um, to feel, again, when we're passionately engaged, we have a lot of different emotions that are going on. And so one of the things that can happen, um, and I, I think it, it's you know, useful to think about that we're human beings, we're also biological creatures, and our body has some imperatives that once they get engaged, they kind of go on their own. And so one of the times that happens or can happen is when folks get triggered. Um, it's really interesting in our biology, we do not, our bi body, our nervous system doesn't differentiate between whether a tiger is chasing you or whether somebody cut you off on the freeway. Um, when it decides it's time for fight or flight response, that's exactly what happens. And so when that shows up in a meeting, what happens? Some folks do flight and they can shut down or they can leave, um, or some folks can, um, have that fight response triggered. And, and, and we've seen what happens when that happens. Things can get, you know, kind of, uh, things can get elevated. Discussions can get heated. Um, you'll notice when, and when I talked about bringing your head and your heart, the executive function is the part of the head that's really helpful in these discussions. We're having troubleshooting uh, discussions. And when fight or flight happens, that executive function, it just, it shuts off. Um, so part of the reason we have these meeting agreements are to avoid having those fight or flight responses. And you'll notice when they're happening, if your mouth starts to go dry, if your pulse starts to race, and as I'm sure you know, this doesn't just happen in meetings, it happens in all parts of life. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of throw that out there. And so we're trying to make sure we have an environment where everybody feels comfortable participating. And we've got those two parts, that executive function, our strategic troubleshooting brain, and our heart engaged. 
Um, and just a couple tips. This is helpful, not just for meetings, but for life. Uh, you've heard that expression, take a deep breath. <laughs> it actually engages your rest and digest system, and it's very calming. And you might not want to do this in a meeting, but I've actually found it helpful uh, if you're on Zoom or if you're you know, on the phone. You can just take your hand, put it on top of your head, and that engages your rest and digest system. So fight or flight, it's automatic. It gets triggered. It's going to kind of go on its own. Uh, and it doesn't matter who you are, how composed you are. It can happen. Uh, it can happen on some of the biggest stages in the world. Um, so those meeting agreements are really about keeping our environment so we can be successful and produce, you know, really useful and valuable outcomes. And I also just want to mention the work that you guys do is so valuable. It changes the quality of people's lives. It improves lives. It extends lives. It saves lives. So the time we spend in this meeting, it's got to be valuable because uh, it's, it's work you're doing inside when you're not doing the work that you do outside. So I just wanted to share that little take. Uh, thank you for the time to do that. And I'm just going to go to the next slide on meeting agreements. All right, let's keep our comments yeah, short and focused. Have, oh, yeah. sure, a quick comment from here. Sure. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead uh, Miss Margaret, go ahead and uh, the mic is yours. I'm on, I have to say something about that. Yes, ma'am. Bring in new knowledge of how to make agreements. You also have to be more including of the historical lack of engagement support that many of our communities have not had and the traumatization that has happened to many of us. You got to be more, have more historical content and details when you go into that type of conversation, all right? There's, a, there's a, some missing links there. Mm -hmm. We wanna talk about how people can become excited, not being thoughtful, but there's a reason why, why, why that has happened. So moving forward, when you want to bring in that kind of conversation to a meeting agreement, you have to be more including and, and present the pro present what you're talking about in a more equitable explanation or statement that support those things that the agencies and the industry have not done for us to be in this place. Thank you for bringing that up, Ms. Margaret. That is incredibly valuable. Um, and it's a, it, there's another group that meets and one of the meeting agreements that we've added is that the discussions that we're having, they don't start today. They are rooted in historical, uh, they're, they're rooted in decades of history. Um, and so that is a very valuable perspective to bring. Um, I'm going to talk later when I talk about uh, talk about the assessment, the memo that came from Cal State Sacramento, which is our organization. I'm going to mention that. Um, and I'm hopeful that when you guys work on your charter, that can be a meeting agreement that gets added. I haven't touched these meeting agreements just out of respect to the work that the group has previously done. Um, but I think that's an incredibly valuable lens to bring to discussions. Jesse. In, so, in support of uh, Miss Margaret and what she was you know, sharing with us, the reality is that we're here because of AB 617 which became law. This was not proposed by any government agency. This came from one of our community assembly members out of meeting with us EJ communities that you know, she works with and associates with so that we made it law and then it became law. So when Ms. Marcus talking about history, you know, it didn't happen because the government and politicians wanted it to happen. We forced it to happen via our working with elected officials who did believe in the cause and they understood our history because they were part of those activists in their community and recognized that we did need a law to be able to now get to this point. So having a little bit of history is also good to know that, you know, even when we deal with other public policies that deal with, in my case, the ports, the ports didn't ask for AB 32, they didn't ask for AB 617, they didn't ask for the at-birth rule. It was 
public laws that came into effect that forced them now to have to deal with it and to com legally comply with it. And now because of AB 617, you know, it encompasses both, you know, your stationary sources as well as mobile sources. And there's never been anything that broad before. And the fact that now it mandates community participation in the development of CAPS, of the CAMPS and, and the SERPs is a new historical precedent. So EJ community sh should also be credited that this is why it's occurring. Thank you. Thank you so much for those comments and bringing that perspective. It's important to carry that history with us today. Thank you. So I'm gonna just, I wanna take a moment and hear that and hold that. And then I'd like to go ahead and transition to these meeting agreements. And like I said, I'm hopeful that a meeting agreement will be developed that holds that lens for that historical uh, perspective. And again, that these discussions don't start from today. They are rooted in decades of work and inequity. Um, so for our meeting today, again, so we can have more productive outcomes, let's keep our comments short, focused on the agenda topics. All perspectives are welcome. Uh, we're looking forward to having a supportive, respectful environment as we had at our last meeting. Um, be comfortable, take breaks as needed. We are aiming to have a 15 minute break uh, or a 10 minute break, depending on how much time we have. Um, but take care of yourselves and let's go to the next slide. It's okay in our conversations to move out our comfort zone, take space, make space, let's focus on the future. And it, it says not the past, the problems, not the people. I am gonna add that caveat, just bringing in what Miss Margaret and Jesse said, the, the, the future is important, but the conversations don't start from before, to, they don't start today. Um, and we can explore with curiosity and let's seek win-win and yes options. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Okay, so before we, we leave here, there's a couple things that I wanna say and talk about uh, in terms of my facilitation approach and how um, hopefully we can run the meeting together. Um, we are, as you notice, we, we've got people in the room, we've got people virtually. I'm gonna try to transition between the room and virtually take comments from the room first and then go to those folks who are virtual. And then the next time I take comments, I'll switch that around. That way we're not just going back and forth. Um, but again, if there's only one person in the room, we'll take that comment and then we'll transition to the next. Um, and then as you know, a lot of folks have worked to build this meeting. Uh, we had a, the consultation group had a uh, planning meeting before this. So I'm gonna do my best to keep us on target. Uh, if something comes up, things emerge, I wanna pay attention to that and then bring us back a, a, as we can. Um, so thank you for the flexibility to do that. So uh, in the room, if you have questions, Brian's explained that and outside of the room, uh, we'll be paying attention to your hands up and then we'll take folks uh, during those times. I see one more question in the room. Yes, Mindy, I'd like to hand the mic over to Miss Margaret. Thank you. I don't know who wrote this, but it's, it, 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 it does not sound very positive. Ms. Margaret, can you tell us what you're slide. talking about? Uh, the previous slide. Okay, let's go back. Focus on the future, not the past, the problems and not the people. The problem has been some people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I don't know who wrote this and did not even address it to some of us who have lived through some of this. I really feel that this is not the place, this is inappropriate to be brought to us who have lived through this. Yeah. And going forward, this type of language should not be added to a meeting agreement unless we as the EJ community helped shape and framed it. And right now, I'm really unhappy about seeing this type of language being utilized in, the, in 2022. I'm really unhappy about that. So Ms. Margaret, thank you. Um, these meeting agreements predate me and, and my team. Um, I definitely agree with you that there's work to do. Um, there is a work group that's being set up to address the charter 
and that will also deal with these meeting agreements. Um, it, so it is our recommendation that this be addressed. Again, we didn't source these, they're not from us. Uh, we're using what's been used from my understanding in past consultation group meetings, but definitely noted. And uh, like I said, our recommendation is that these agreements be revised. I've been here since the beginning. I have never seen this type of language. I don't know who put this content and the details together, but it's inappropriate. It's very inappropriate. It's not as you, if you say focus on the future, how are we gonna focus on the future if we don't know the past? Yes, ma'am. I, I, not the past and the problems, and we still living in the past. A lot of, a lot of our communities are still living in the past. It's totally inappropriate for somebody to put this on paper. Totally thank you. Thank you, Miss Margaret. I, I, I interjected that it really to remember the, the historical uh, parts of this. And I, I, I hear you. And I'm hoping that these meeting agreements will be uh, revisited. Hi, Mindy. We have a comment from Luis Almeida. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, I, I'm in agreement. I think what we're hearing here is that he needs an update. So you're, you're saying there's a work group that will make that happen. Yes. And I encourage everybody to participate in that work group to address these concerns. And thank you for raising it, Ms. Margaret and Luis. Are there any other questions in the room? Oh, uh, we have one from Jesse. Hi, Jesse. Well, part of my concern, you know, is, is also in, in supporting Margaret and Luis in that EJ communities, you know, for decades have faced all kinds of problems, issues, impacts. Some of them dealing with laws, with policies, with rules, regulations, with <laughs> programs, and we have as a part of our responsibilities, identified any of the issues with each one of these. So when we move forward, it's looking at that checklist of what was the problems, what were the obstacles, what were the racist things, what were the discriminatory things that need to be addressed and corrected for the future. So we can't just say, forget the past and move forward. The past is our checklist that our communities our families and our neighbors are asking us to make sure we resolve it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Deldi? No, just wanted to reinforce the suggestion that um, we take this up again in the temporary work group that will focus on governance. I also want to just note that in that one agreement about focusing on the, on the future, not the past, and also the way that we interact with people, there are actually two big ideas there. I do think it is important for us to maintain some sort of agreement that um, has us commit to treating each other in this room and in this group with respect, meaning that we can disagree with each other and still remain collegial and still work to solve problems. And I think part of what's frustrating is that that one agreement really had two big ideas in it and we should probably separate them. Thank you. And I, I encourage you to keep the comments that folks have made uh, in mind when this is be re being revisited in the temporary work group. All right, so I'd like to go ahead and move us along. Very appreciative of the comments that have come. Um, we have some transitions coming up and we just want to just call them out. Um, as I mentioned when I first joined this group that I was here uh, for the meetings through April. Um, and so this is our April meeting. And then I am actually uh, retiring for various reasons. And so I am gonna be passing the baton of the consultation group over to my colleague, Lisa, and she'll be serving as the facilitator. Uh, and then uh, Deldi's gonna talk about what's going to happen uh, beyond June, because I believe there may be additional transitions that happen. Uh, so she'll speak to that. Um, but Lisa, I'd just like to, Lisa's been a colleague that's worked with me for the past six years. She's insightful and uh, heartfelt 
and she pays amazing attention uh, to the various concerns that, that folks raise and that go on. So I feel like I'm leaving you in her really capable hands. Um, and so I'd just like to pass the mic over to Lisa and have her briefly introduce herself. Sure, thank you so much, Mindy. I'll just make it brief. Um, I think I met most of you over the past few months and it's been a pleasure working on this project. Um, just to introduce myself real briefly, um, I'm also a lead facilitator with uh, CCP along with Mindy. I've been with CCP since about 2015. I worked on various uh, facilitation and community engagement projects on a variety of policy initiatives, uh, primarily environmental topics. And prior to joining CCP, I worked on Envi uh, California Environmental Quality Act projects for over 20 years. And so I'm looking forward just to supporting the continued you know, progress and productivity of this group. And my goal is just to make the transition as smooth as possible. And I plan to just continue all the processes that Mindy has put into place. And I just wanted to offer to anybody to please feel free to reach out to me at any point if you have any questions or concerns or comments as we go forward. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you. And Deldi, I'd like to pass it on to you for your updates and, um, oh, actually for your comments on the, the facilitation transitions. Thank you. And Mindy, the first thing I wanna do is wish you a heartfelt congratulations on your retirement. I know everyone else here too wishes you well. Uh, I've only known you for a few months, but it feels like a lifetime um, in terms of everything we have done together in this short amount of time. And so just thank you for your thoughtfulness and your leadership in this space. And thank you, Lisa, um, as well. I know you've been um, perhaps not as front and center as, as Mindy, but I know you've been as every big as part of making our meetings um, get to the place they are now, which is a really great, great place. And I also wanna just lift up Corin. Uh, Corin has been instrumental in helping us figure out all of this um, hybrid stuff. It's very challenging. And I just wanna appreciate him as a member of the team and say thank you. Um, we are uh, currently in a contract agreement with Sac State. This is why you see in the memo that uh, logo from Sac State, they, they are the organization that did the assessment and they are the organization that we are currently under contract with. Um, we are concurrently working on a um, expanded scope of work to support all of the 617 facilitation needs for the next few years. And we will be letting that contract um, hopefully shortly uh, for competition. Um, it's still um, very much uh, a work in progress in terms of the work we need to do to get it out there. And we um, hope to have a big roster of organizations that we would um, make sure are aware of it so that they can compete for the contract. Um, and there will be more to come, but we hope that we'll be able to be in that new contract um, space for facilitation for this group and everything else that we need support for um, by late summer um, at the latest. Hey, hey Deldi, do I mind interrupting for a second? Uh, Luis Olmedo had a comment. Sure, Luis. Well, thanks. I guess there's really no order or, or time that best say this. I just, you know, I know many of you've mentioned a couple of meetings now, right? The last meeting, this meeting that you're transitioning out. So I uh, just want to let you know that um, similar to what Ms. Margaret has said, I mean, there's a lot of history. So when you step into these roles, you kind of own it, right? create a path forward, but I just want to just thank you. I, I think you've done a great job considering just the baggage and the history that exists there. Uh, and uh, I mean, look forward to working uh, with Lisa or anyone else who joins that team. Um, I, I, for one, I certainly you know, miss your, your uh, participation and how well you've been able to handle, um, you know, just the difficult situations that exist here that perhaps predate a lot of people in the room. Thank you. Thank you. It's been my utmost pleasure working with you and in, in the consultation group and also uh, working with the coalition uh, in the other meeting that we have. So thank you guys for, you know, allowing me to have such a valuable project to work on as I make my exit from the working world. So thank you. So Delia, I'm going to uh, turn it over to you now for um, for our updates. Uh, sure. And I'll try to go through these a little bit quickly because we want to make sure we save our space for uh, talking about our two chapters in the blueprint. 
Um, I wanna thank everyone again for participating in the agenda setting meetings. This is an invaluable practice that again, Mindy has helped us institutionalize. Um, we had tried to do it and we uh, have been, I think more successful with under her support. So thank you all um, when you have time to do that. A sub quorum met on March 1st to help us out with that. Um, also just wanna flag for you that the meeting summary for January 25th um, had been posted for comment. We didn't get any comments, but we're certainly a welcome, welcome any. Um, and that uh, currently is on our webpage. Um, we already talked about the assessment report. We'll dive into it um, later in the agenda, but I do just wanna flag that again, um, CARB finds the assessment report to be incredibly valuable and helpful to us as a roadmap for the future, not only for the consultation group, but um, really also to guide the temporary group that's gonna focus on governance. There's a lot of really helpful recommendations in that assessment. And speaking of that, we do have this uh, governance, uh, we're calling it an ad hoc work group. Uh, we're looking to have the first kickoff conversation for this sometime in April. And um, we again welcome uh, volunteers who would like to participate in that. Currently we have Kevin Hamilton, Ms. Margaret, Christine Wolf, and Catherine Higgins. If there is anyone else who would like to be part of this effort, please send an email uh, to Liliana or let one of us know today if you're in the room or by email if you would like to um, participate. Thank you, Delly. appreciate that. Um, so can we go ahead to the slide on the review process and timeline? So in the interest of transparency, which is something when we were doing the interviews, when we were doing the uh, meetings that we had with, with select members of the consultation group, we heard over and over again that transparency was really important, that understanding what the trajectory is uh, of the group, meaning what meetings are going to happen and what's going to be covered, having that information in advance is really important. Um, and so if we can go on to the next slide. There we go. So in your packet uh, is a list of the meetings that are going to be happening uh, for the next year. Uh, we've condensed them onto the slide just so that it's easier to present. As you can see, most of the items that are in black, the buckets are listed by time, and most of the buck, uh, most of the items in black pertain to what's happening with consultation group, and the items in blue pertain to what's happening with the um, the carb board. So I'm just going to quickly go through this. Uh, what happened in the past, uh, since September rather, is that chapters one and two were reviewed in November, January, chapters three and four. Uh, in February, uh, the revised program blueprint update was presented at the CARB meeting. Uh, and then April 2nd is where we are now reviewing the chapters five and six. Upcoming at the board meeting, there's going to be a presentation um, uh, on the people's blueprint. Uh, and we're also going to be, and there will be members from the consultation group that participate in that. In June, there'll be a discussion uh, on chapter seven and eight. And then in the summer, there'll be ongoing public engagement on the program blueprint update. Uh, August 22nd, there'll be a review of chapters nine and 10. Uh, and then in August of this year, rather. And then the consultation group will complete that review of, of the people's blueprint with that chapters nine and 10. Uh, the, the full draft of the program blueprint uh, is going to be posted in late 2022, early 2023. There'll be public comment, workshops, uh, and consultation group meetings for that for the review of the program blueprint. Uh, and then in late 2023, there's going to be ongoing engagement. CARB will post the final draft of the program blueprint for public comment, and then the board will act on it by September 2023. Any questions or comments on this timeline? I see a question in the room. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Margaret. And My then, question is, there will be an EIR, correct? Who'd like to take that? EIR for this blueprint. Hi, this is Abigail May. Let me try to um, get my camera on as I here. Um, so for the, the blueprint, we'll be ensuring that we comply with any CEQA obligations. And so I believe for the last blueprint, we prepared um, an environmental analysis. So as we move forward with the draft, 
we'll analyze what the CEQA obligations are, and then we will, of course, be compliant with the law. So we'll keep you updated as we go along about what those. Say that again, because I'm not here. Your your mask is very muffling to me. So I I'm apologize. Let me let me pull down said. my mask. I'm old, so I'm not hearing everything that you're saying. That's okay. I have hearing issues as well. So my name is Abigail May. Um, just a reminder, I'm a senior attorney with CARB, and we will comply with CEQA for the blueprint. But the last time we prepared the blueprint, we prepared um, an environmental analysis. There were no um, specific um, new projects to be created. So what we'll do is we'll keep everybody updated as we go along with the process to develop the blueprint and, and what exactly the environmental analysis will be to comply with okay, CEQA. Well, I'm not understanding what you say. Environmental analysis is that no is the yes there will be EIR I no there's not an EIR I'm so yep yeah, right so there will not be an EIR because CARB actually does not create EIRs we have a separate certified regulatory program that we comply with CEQA under and the name of our document is not an environmental impact report it's not an EIR it's called an environmental analysis okay the environmental analysis will there be a workshop or orientation to the membership, the membership of the consultation group and to the public and to the, when I say the public, I'm talking about all the AB 617 sites to understand how it applies. Yes, there will be public transparency about that. And I didn't ask about public transparency. I'm asking for orientation and education on what you just said of this assessment, because this is the first time the word uh, an environmental assessment has been brought to us as the public and the environmental group. Yeah, that? that's not a document. That's not part of the learning curve for us to clearly understand how this document is being certified. So we clearly understand the, the who, the what, the how, the, what, the where, and the what why that is not being clearly to me clearly being delivered right now absolutely i understand so thank you for clarifying and i think that that's something i would love to talk with deldi about that about how we can uh, improve that process and maybe that's something that we could bring back to the consultation group to explain what the process was for the original blueprint and the draft plan for the updated blueprint and and explain that more fully so that all of your questions can be answered yeah because at the first blueprint we didn't have that information for orientation or for education so i'm so i'm asking right now that this be adhered to so we have those clarifications and in detail in detail and in content. So we understand how this document is going to be utilized as this environmental assessment, because that has not, that has not been part of the educational surface, uh, circle for many of us. It may be for you because you're the attorney and maybe for the other staff, but it has not been broke down to a place where we clearly understand if that, what authority does it have how it's going to be utilized, what, how you make a complaint, a good, bad, and different. We have no idea of what that is. So it got to be a full scale, a much more full scale, comprehensive document to be able that all of the sites, either in monitoring or in uh, doing action plan, and also the air districts clearly understand how this document, that process is being utilized as further use in determining plans of action for these AB 647 communities. Thank you, Ms. Margaret. Deldi. I just want to note, Ms. Margaret, we are um, making notes here of in very critical topics to make sure to include for our future agendas for this group. And I'm hearing you say we need an orientation as the consultation group um, for the blueprint. Um, the influence, the, the weight that it carries, and certainly how it connects to our compliance with CEQA. So it is on the list. We have captured it. Thank you. And Mindy, we have two more questions in the room. We have uh, Jesse Marquez, and then we're going to have Luis Olmedo. So okay. Jesse, go ahead. From our perspective, the blueprint is a critical document for our work that we do. And I do not want to see it go past 
and be adopted in late 2023. I would like to have this wrapped up this year so that we can start the new year with a new document. We are first quarter right now. And so I would like to have it you know, wrapped up by you know, the third quarter and then a vote and approval by the fourth quarter. That way we start the new year with a new document, not the end of the year. See, because it's not only our organizations and the CSCs doing this, it's also the government agencies that are also following the script. And historically, our AQMDs have been the least supportive of us moving forward. And this would just support them in delaying their cooperation in us and making these things happen sooner versus later. later. So I don't know what, if it takes a vote from us. And with all due respect to the members here that are part of that special committee on it, uh, you know, I definitely would want them to get back with us as to what is what, what time frame is good for them, but it would be my wish list to wrap it up this year. Okay. Thank you, Jesse. Okay. Luis. Yeah, along the same lines as uh, Jesse mentioned, um, I was doing the math and the scoping plan, what is it? It's correct me from, is it five years? And there is a very strong effort to make sure to meet that deadline, right? And I know that there have been efforts to try to extend that deadline. I mean, I know that because I serve on that advisory as well. And um, it hasn't been any budging for that at all. And it only reminds me of how environmental justice builds frustration over the years. And, you know, certainly Ms. Margaret done, you know, communicated that very well, and I, I, I share those sentiments. But it seems like when it comes to environmental justice and the efforts of 617, which was supposed to be a, a um, program that was supposed to alleviate and address environmental justice issues, then, you know, be done next year or the year after that, or there's really no pressure. There's really no, I don't see the same level of, of um, push to say, we've got to meet these deadlines because communities are counting on that. Environmental justice is counting on that. Communities that have been burdened and have, you know, I, there's two, I, I just love our leadership in the state because I remember when uh, Secretary Blumenfeld uh, was confirmed you know, he said, you know, they asked him a question and his response is, um, just as delayed as just as denied. And um, I also love our Governor Newsom and also Secretary Crowfoot often says, you know, we need to right the wrongs of the past. And, and here we have an opportunity and I don't see the acceleration and the momentum and that, and, and you know, going back to the principles that had been there and predated Mandy, predated maybe perhaps many people here. Um, you know, it's not about people. It, sometimes it does feel like it is about people and it is about certain people that get a certain privilege and priority over other people. And in this case, environmental justice does not feel like we're getting the same um, privilege and priority because it's okay, let's push it down the road. It's 2023. Why push a little more? They can wait. As to where the scoping plan seems like, let's accelerate that because we got some really important people that are counting on that. So keep that in mind. I think that's, I, I don't know who really needs to hear. I'm glad board members are here. But I mean, we're not asking for much. We're just, just asking for equity and justice, right? That's all. And I think these are examples of we, we need to level the playing field and we need to be fair and equitable to everything and everyone, especially disadvantaged, vulnerable populations. And this tool and this document is extremely important and it shouldn't um, be left uh, to a different time clock or a different standard. And it does feel that way. So thank you. Thank you, Luis. Kevin. Good morning. <clears throat> thank you for this opportunity. and. Uh, Again, uh, uh, just want to also thank uh, the committee. 
uh, for coming together again. I, I want to echo both Jesse and Luis's and other comments regarding timeline here. When we first started uh, the People's Blueprint, as it's come to be called, um, the reason we did it was our frustration with CARB at dragging its feet in this group to a certain extent, but actually CARB being the the cornerstone and and the convener is to, is accountable. Uh, their feet on this, and so they have five years total from I think it's 2018. So it appears now that rather than get ahead of this, and in fact, in the face of the tremendous need to have this guidance by everybody from top to bottom, uh, from I would think CARB staff all the way down to uh, uh, air districts and out to the communities that are affected by this and part, those of us participating in these programs. Uh, we need this new guidance. We're working off a guidance document that is not only out of date, it's almost irrelevant uh, in place, certainly with regard to community steering committees, forcing everybody to sort of limp along and try their best to come up with solutions, which I think people have been doing, but it's it's not there's no consistency across the uh, the state on this. So one group or one uh, community gets one thing, and everybody looks and says, "Oh, well, they got that. We didn't we?" And then you know, then the it starts again. And I can't imagine how much time my colleagues have spent doing this activity that we should not have had to do because this should have been done. But uh, when the need was obvious, but instead it was not. And so we've all been sort of working from behind. I mean, it's hard to think about the future when you're constantly working from behind because you're uncovering things that are no longer relevant in the guidance that you have. So now we're talking about putting that guidance off for almost another full year. And that just is not acceptable. We've started a whole new round now, or starting a whole new round of community air grants. Um, we're trying to work on different types of solution, but certainly the original guidance will not fit that at all, doesn't recognize it. And again, there's nothing that requires um, local agencies or others to, to sort of uh, adhere to what, no, there's no rule. What are you talking about? We have guidance, yes, but and we're doing that. And in most cases, given the guidance, they are following it. But again, it was never intended to be a long-term solution. So we need to, whatever we need to do to pick up the pace, or if it's with regard to this section of the overall blueprint, which the community uh, organization, the community selection, and all of that process in that compartment in the blueprint could be done and print it at least in approved draft form or something much more quickly. I think we're way far ahead of that. And then the other technical pieces, I still haven't seen any of those, but I, you know, is CARB staff working on that? Are we going to see drafts of those that have to be included here on, I'll give an example, air toxics? Uh, I mean, have you been working on that? That would be the other part of that. Okay. That Thank you so much. Document Kevin. and the work that's needed to be done. But timelines out to 2023, come on. You Thank know, you. It's just crazy. Thank you for your comments. Chanel. Well, I first want to say, I want to thank, um, I want to thank everyone for this kind of conversation and this kind of dialogue. Because I think to me, this is what is so valuable about being in this space um, and having these conversations. And this is what we want to hear, right? So we want to hear feedback. We want to know what's working, what's not working. Um, one of the things that I did, I did just want to note and flag um, is that part of what we're trying to do, and, and again, Deldi, Deldi can chime in on this too, is we are trying to make sure that we set up like a process, right, that's transparent that's public, that people have time to weigh in on. And I think for, for the people's blueprint, I mean, that's why we're having the May board meeting. And I think on the slide that was shown, right, like that's why we're giving it that board meeting, we're planning that and wanting to do that again um, in consultation with this group to make sure that we're not, you know, uh, we're not just kind of having this happen in the back, but that we're really putting it to the forefront and to the center. So I did want to acknowledge that. 
Um, I think part of what we were also thinking about was the public engagement and the robust process. I think, for example, we brought up the scoping plan. I think some of the concerns that we've heard from EJ advocates about the scoping plan, for example, have really been around the, uh, the timeline and how quickly it's moving and how there hasn't been enough time um, to vet it by community members, by residents. And so um, I think that's, that's the balancing act. And I just want to be transparent about that. Um, in the sense that like obviously there is urgency and we want to make sure this moves forward and we also want to make sure that we had that time um, and that we're not uh, rushing it forward. So I did want to note that I did want to say that um, this is something that's a big priority to us and I think again that's why we're having that May board meeting and that's why I think we're working with this group here um, but really do appreciate all these the kind of the conversation and hearing that a 2013 is too far out. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. And then Delvi, I think if you have other things that you wanted to say, I'm happy to turn it over to you as well. Thank you, Chanel. No, that's absolutely right. Um, we are balancing the um, time that we need for robust engagement. As starting with engagement with our consultation group on the people's blueprint. And this is why we have methodically been going two chapters at a time um, during our meetings to have dialogue with this group about the people's blueprint, which will significantly inform CARB's program blueprint. Um, I also just wanna share, we think about the blueprint as our statewide strategy. And we know that there, are, as Kevin, as you were alluding to, there are other approaches that we need to start taking now, right? And we also want those strategies to be housed in the statewide strategy, right? So we want to, and we need the time to have dialogue with stakeholders, um, with our 617 communities, with air district partners, with communities that have not yet been selected to be in the program. That does take time. So um, the September 23 is the backstop. That is when the law says we must have an updated blueprint, um, but we are trying to make the best use we can of, all, um, of that time in between uh, to do things that do sit, take some time. Just earlier, we heard about CEQA compliance. That takes CARB about six months to do. So, um, and, and also we asked, we heard from you, Kevin, about other things that we internally are doing in CARB to prepare for um, the, the program blueprint. We are updating a very key appendix in the blueprint, appendix F, are those actions that CARB is committing to, um, to bring additional reductions through regulatory and other kinds of approaches. We are busy internally working with each of our divisions um, to seek those commitments and be ready to share them for public comment. We are also working on an outline of the program blueprint. We will have this ready to share at our May 19th board hearing. Um, and I did um, also want to just say a little bit about that board hearing. Um, we will have a representative group of our consultation uh, group actually at that board hearing on May 19th in Riverside um, to share their perspectives on the people's blueprint, but also on the statewide strategy as a whole. So other kinds of approaches that we know we need to take or that others think we need to take to bring benefits to more communities under this program. Thank you, Delhi. I just wanna do a quick time check. Um, it's 3.05, we're running about 25 minutes behind time. This has been a really valuable conversation. I'm just calling attention to, we're gonna have a little bit less discussion time on the chapters um, and I'll make some adjustments uh, to give maximum time to discussion. I just wanted to give that time check. It looks like we have a comment in the room. Oh yes, many we have two. We're gonna start with Luis Olmedo and then we can hand over to Paulo Torado. Okay. So um, I've been doing this for quite a while and I remember one time I was in front of a federal official and gave me a whole 30 minutes of time and kind of laid out a whole plan. And, and uh, one thing I, it's 30 minutes were over and, and I was like, well, what's next? Well, you didn't make an ask. Like, what do you mean? Well, you didn't make an ask. Well, oh, well, here's the ask is your 30 minutes are up, right? So one thing I've learned is I always make an ask. And the ask is, I, I like to ask that the time or the deadline be brought to October, 2022. Now, if CARB or the board or others in this process uh, have different thoughts or ideas, obviously there's already a, 
a plan laid out, but I'd, I'd like to bring it back to October 22, 2022. So that's the ask. I do honor and respect my colleagues and what, what their wishes are, but I at least like to put a, an ask on the table uh, for the completion of this um, plan or the, the blueprint. Thank you, Luis. And I believe we had another comment in the room. Yes, thank you, Mindy. Uh, this is Paula with PSRLA. And I wanted um, to bring up a clarifying question. I think there's a there's two parallel processes, one like the people's blueprint and the official document that CARP will, you know, you officially use as the guide for the 617 implementation. So um, I don't know if I'm getting the timeline confused, but according to your timeline, this the people's blueprint will be reviewed in May. So what does that mean in terms of the official document? Because as, as Kevin and, and um, my colleagues mentioned, there's a sense of urgency in, in the 617 blueprint, the current 617 blueprint, it's, it's, it's lacking a lot of relevancy for, for new co-leadership models that are emerging and different needs. So, so I agree of uh, moving up the, ti the, the timeline, but I wanted to clarify what like the differences between those two processes, how are they correlating to each other? How are they informing each other? And what is the different timelines and deadlines for, for both those processes, if, if that makes sense? So if you could clarify that, that, that would uh, be helpful. Yes, Paula, that's a, a great question. So earlier in the slides, um, Mindy was walking through the schedule of for this group for when we would take up various chapters. So we're meeting every other month and every meeting we are covering two chapters. And so that takes us, I believe it was to August. Um, is that right, Mindy? Maybe you could share that slide again. Well, let's go ahead and pull that slide up and Yes, the, if, if we were to get through all the chapters um, as they're articulated in, in the uh, timeline, it would be chapters nine and 10 would be in August. And concurrently and internally, CARB is working to prepare for updating the program blueprint. But the dialogue that happens here, for example, the one that will happen later when we can get to it of chapters five and six are going to inform how we construct the program blueprint based on what's in the people's blueprint. So we are not taking comment on the people's blueprint in order to update the people's blueprint. It stands as it is, but the dialogue around it informs what we are going to do with the program blueprint. I don't know if that helps Paula at all, but. Yeah, that, that helps. And there okay. will be a process for, so once you take all the feedback and, and use the people's blueprint to inform the, the actual blueprint, Will there be a time for engagement and back and forth within with this the consultation groups? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank there you. will be a deep dive into next steps, just as Ms. Margaret articulated, where we will then go into depth with this group about all the different steps we are taking to produce the final program blueprint. That includes the engagement that we will have with the public. And you, our consultation group members, you actually have a very important role to play in that we also are going to rely on you to engage with your constituencies and your stakeholders to help us create opportunities for further dialogue about the, the final program blueprint. I mean, we are, oh, sorry, go ahead, Paula, sorry. Oh, <laughs> sorry, uh, maybe we also have a comment here from board member Hurt would like to speak. Please, thank you. Thank you. Just, just a really quick comment. Um, I wanna thank everybody for your comments around being swift. Oh, it's on, it's green. We, we could do, we, it would be great if we could hear you a little bit better. Is this better? Much better, oh, thank you. Go. All right, I'll, I'll eat the microphone here. Um, I, I wanna just thank everybody for their comments and thank you, Mr. Olmedo, with the ask. Those are wise words, I agree. So now there's something tangible we can think about as far as working from that point, uh, getting there quickly. Uh, from a board perspective, we, um, or at least I, support moving forward swiftly as well. Um, we also need to be intentional and inclusive and making sure that we bring everyone along in this process. And that includes technical support, engagement with the public, those conversations that we're having today. 
And I'm hopeful that with that skillful engagement that all of you have been doing in your communities, we will get to a faster timeline. Um, but I, I, I think um, moving forward swiftly is important, but making sure we bring everyone along. And I, I hear a lot of the trust and the building that still needs to happen. And, uh, and hopefully we can do that sooner in time and make this blueprint uh, come out and, and, and ready for use in all the air districts and statewide. So um, I'll stop there. I look forward to the discussion with chapter five. Thank you. Thank you. So why don't we go ahead if there's no other questions, I'd really like us to move the agenda and go to chapter five. It looks like for both chapter five and six, uh, we've got about 20 minutes of discussion. Not sure if that's gonna be sufficient. Um, so let's begin with chapter five and we'll see how we go. Um, Initially, we had planned on having a summation to provide some framing for the conversation, moving on to clarifying questions, comments, and then having a deep dive uh, with the time that we have. Um, I'm hopeful that everybody had a chance to review the framing document, which was the summation. Um, so I'm not going to provide uh, in-depth framing. I'm just going to sort of give a, a quick um, sentence of what the chapter is about, uh, not talk about what's in each section. Um, and then we'll go to clarifying questions, which means if there's something you didn't understand, that's where you ask it right there. If you have a comment or a suggestion, leave that until we get to the comment piece. And I don't think we're going to make it to deep dive. So I'm going to give a quick summation, uh, take clarifying questions, hold your comments at that point, and then we'll move straight to comments if there are no clarifying questions. Any question on the process? Okay, great. So basically, this is chapter five. Uh, it, it's really about uh, harvesting the learnings uh, from the first round of AB 617 uh, funding opportunities. Uh, it's broken up into three sections, pre-selection, selection, and post-selection. And it's recommending these new ideas, these processes for capacity, and capacity analysis, building, uh, community selection and collaborating with communities statewide. So let's go ahead and move to any. We're gonna it's we're gonna skip these slides. So let's just go ahead and jump to the slide for um, taking clarifying questions. And initially, we'd hope to take clarifying questions on each section, but I don't think we have time for that. My apologies. Uh, so are there any clarifying questions for chapter five? Jesse. Oh, go ahead, Jesse. Yeah, this is Jesse. This also reflects back on what's, what Miss Margaret brought up. CARB has already gone through the process of identifying eligible communities. I recall a list of 350, 400 communities that have already been identified. So it's not a mystery about it because that has already occurred. The clarifying question is, does that list need to be revised so that additional communities at that time, because we're talking a couple of years ago now, that you know, we're not aware of this whole process and now they're enlightened and would now like an opportunity to be added to that list. So that's the first part. The second part then is that we've also asked that CARB create a schedule of phase in. Now, we do understand that when you kick off something like what we just did, you know, 10 were like the pilot project ones, okay? But then what should have been established already, okay, if we have 400, <laughs> And if we only do 10 a year, does that mean it's going to take 40 years by the time we get to everybody? Well, that's not acceptable. We have, we need CARB to say, okay, according to the law, we had to have identified these 400 and it needs to be done in five years or it needs to be done in 10 years. So that needs to be clarified. The third portion to that is that the funding 
to support that, <laughs> okay? You're gonna have 10 existing now. We only added, you know, three or four this last go around, you know? So the issues we brought up in the past too is, you know, what is the budget to support those are already up and running? And then what's gonna be the budget for the new ones kicking in? Because we've also discussed the need to go before legislature and the governor to let them know that, hey, at the beginning, we didn't know what the budget was gonna be. But now that we know there's 400 organizations and we have to get it done in five years or 10 years, the budget is gonna be this much. So you need to appropriate that and approve it today now so that all future budgets and appropriations already know you have to kick in 100 million a year, 250 million a year, or whatever that number is. So those are clarifying things I think need to be added to this. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Oh, what happened? Sorry about that. I was trying to hit the green button. Is that, can you hear me now? We can, thank oh, you. Okay, good. I just wanted to chime in on what Jesse was saying because <laughs> We, we really need clarity around, around exactly those, both those points, the one on where are we on the community list and what needs to be added or what needs to be revised and then match that to timing and budget so that we can together uh, collectively um, make our points to the legislature because this group is really diverse. And if we can come together on a budget ask like that, I think it's going to be very powerful, but we just got to be really clear. And I tell you the truth, I, I'm sorry, I can't even remember sort of Jesse where we are on that, but it would be great to get some clarity around it. So we're prepared to do what we need to do to keep the program doing what we all had hoped. Thank you so much. I see comments in the room, questions in the room. Oh, yes, Minnie, go ahead, Louise. Thank you. Uh, in their section of us assess, conduct a readiness, technical capacity, and eligible. Uh, there is a piece that is more and more becoming very obvious in terms of the readiness. The um, state has had enormous amount of resources to invest in communities around um, you know, renewable energy, uh, energy equity, and uh, many programs. And one of the things that I've been saying for years now is that in the past, because I see it getting better, I, I do, I see improvement. It's heading in a whole new, better direction. But initially there was pretty much anybody who had the resources and capacities to have the ear of those making decisions around um, investment priorities were sort of first loading order because it was the easiest. They were right here, they were right in front and they were proposing projects to go out and implement whether it was solar, whether it's, it's um, uh, monitoring, uh, was it electrical vehicle charging station, what have you, many different tree planting projects. So I, I really like, I mean, the word intentional because I think this, the CARP can be very intentional and not, just relying on the very little in comparison that 617 gets. It can be very intentional in making sure that more of the resources go to communities that can fast track their capacity, technical abilities. And I'll tell you, at one point in time, we weren't operating 70 plus monitors in the Salton Sea Air Basin. At one point in time, we weren't uh, even thinking about having the capacity to move the installment from start planning, permitting, operation of an electrical vehicle charging station. Never did we think that we would procure an electric vehicle and begin to plan on building a mobile uh, electric uh, monitoring, thanks to XB 617 and, and air grants. Um, but that is sort of the smaller uh, amount of resources out there. We don't give communities an opportunity to build it from the ground up in the neighborhoods. We're never going to be able to create capacities, create local jobs, create local sustainability. And these are great opportunities for the state as a leader, not only being intentional within its own 
uh, portfolio of programs that it has authority over uh, to direct and invest in this advantaged community and potentially uh, help fast track the capacity building, not just depending on the air grants. Because we know, I mean, I think we can all agree in comparison gets very, very little. And every year we have to fight for those dollars. I mean, there's a $30 million for mobile monitoring. It's like, we can only wish that air grants get that kind of money, right? And so um, it also has, I think as a, as a global leader and certainly a state leader, could have influence over all climate programs to make sure that we're uh, signaling to other agencies to say, give communities a first opportunity chance to build that capacity, build that knowledge and, and be able to fast track their readiness. And, and I think here's opportunities that language can go in there uh, to make sure we signal that. So thank you. Thank you. And I just want to call out, I feel like the group has transitioned to comments. So I want to invite everybody to share any comments that they have. Um, in the room, did I see Jesse's hand up next? Yes, we have a Jesse and then Miss Margaret and Paula Torado. Okay, and then Kevin, I'll go to you, all right? In follow up to a comment that Luis just made regarding priorities. In our earlier discussions going back a year or two, I had also brought up the fact that there are different types of communities. And in some cases, some of those communities have multiple, you know, hazardous things there. So therefore they're given like a priority, but I also want to show respect to communities where it might be one community. However, the impact they have is very significant. And so we need, there has been no identification or what are the different categories of, a, of communities. And one that I specifically brought up where it's like a mining community. It's only gonna be one community <laughs> right there, you know, but all the water's been contaminated. You know, all the fish have been killed. You know, all the habitats have been destroyed. There's no fresh water. So it is only a one issue type thing, so to speak. But at the same time, we need to identify what our priority types so that we may not have picked them in the first 10. They may have been not picked in the sum of only three, but we have to set a priority that, you know, they will be in the third category or fourth category because we just can't have them saying, oh, they're never going to get to us. When are they going to get to us? We have a moral responsibility and a public responsibility to give them an opportunity to know when are they next? When will they be there? Because it also helps in them preparing for that as well. And they want to, might want to take advantage of attending some of these training sessions ahead of time. They might want to take advantage of reading Margaret's SERP from Oakland. They might want time to look at Jesse's SERP from Wilmington Carson, West Long Beach, because those take you know, weeks to read and comprehend. And then we learn and having doing it, we never had time to even consult with each other because the pace, the pace was so fast, it did not allow that. Well, I want to be able to show respect to these other communities and some of them are Native American reservations. I want to show respect to them that we recognize you, we have identified you, we've not forgotten you, but you could also start the process a year ahead of time because you already know, you know next year you're on the list. So don't wait till next year and say, oh, you start tomorrow, you start next month when you could have prepared for a year in advance. We want them to have that advantage to learn in advance and that option. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Let's go to the next person in the room, please. Sure, it's Ms. Margaret. Gordon, West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project. I'm looking at page two of the uh, consultation of framing the people's blueprint on chapter five and six bullet four, where it says, um, courses will be included, hyper-local monitoring and modeling. Okay, to do real hyper-local modeling from my experience, that means that you're gonna have a monitor from the source to the street where people live at, to the sidewalk and inside people's houses. And a certain uh, certain uh, 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 location. I do not see an air district or car 
willing to spend money to support a community to get that type of data. If you really truly gonna understand ground truthing and hyperlocal. And then also as citizen science have the resident be partners to who is the technical staff as a contractor or as the individual air districts participating and trying to get this information. So this is so broad, it needs to be specific of what is the steps of the process to when you start talking about hyperlocal. Ms. Margaret, I just wanna make sure I'm tracking. You're in chapter five? I'm on chapter, um, no, page two, page two. Of what, what ma'am? Of uh, AB6, April the 1st, 2022 consultation group meeting, draft framing of the People's Blueprint, chapter five and six for the GH, CG, uh, CJ, CG consultation, page two. Okay, ma'am, that was just a summary for folks to just make all right, sure. I'm also, all right, it may be a summary, but that's not, a, that's not the reality. Okay, thank you, ma'am. All right, that's not the reality. Because right now, the, there's no one having, no one has predicted the process for doing this type of stuff. My experience so far, when you start talking about hyperlocal, has been we work, we as West Oakland Environmental Indicators work with Alkama, had the Google Earth car traveling through our neighborhood for two years. So it got to be, and I do not see in the uh, agriculture area. They're having monitors in the field to where people live at, to their sidewalks, to their schools, simultaneously gathering data to be more hyper-local. Ms. Margaret, so I'm hoping- so, yeah, so when this word hyper-local comes, and that it has to be more comprehensive and understanding the who is going to attract the process for getting hyper-local data. Thank you, Ms. Margaret. I just want to. I mean, just when you use those words, let's be very clear about the thinking. Thank you, Ms. Margaret. That's chapter six, and we're going to go there. And let's look at the language that's in chapter six of the People's Blueprint and make sure that there's a specificity there that you're asking for. Yeah, but I'm, I'm going there right now. Right. Well, we're in chapter five, ma'am. So okay. I'm just going to ask if we could finish with chapter five. It does say chapter five. It actually is chapter five, Mindy, on chapter the very five. first page there of the, of the summary of chapter five does reference hyperlocal as part of what is Planning should be assessed. Thank you. Yes, and practices. So I'm just, I'm just, maybe I, I'm ahead of myself. I'm maybe ahead of the group, but I'm, uh, so when you start using that language of hyperlocal, we got to be very careful about what is the plan of action to be more including and equity in the process. Thank you, Ms. Margaret. So my question then is in chapter five of the People's Blueprint, does it address hyperlocal to your satisfaction or do we need to put more meat on the bone with what's in chapter five? No, we need of the to put People's more meat Blueprint? on this bone because it has to be more including all those, those spaces, the spaces throughout those that, uh, that particular areas or territory or, or boundaries to be challenging for that information. Because you can't get you can't get the proximity without having a really exponential monitoring process to be more including. Okay. And, and then that the project then it comes down to who the who is going to navigate this process. Who Thank is navigating you. this? Is this the, is that in partnership with the, the, the impacted community? Impact environmental community? Is that with the uh, a contractor? Is that with the air district? Is that with CARB? Is that with public health? The who? 
Thank you, Ms. Margaret. Appreciate that. And so, Mindy, we had uh, Paula Toronto is next in the room, and Luis also raised his hand. I don't know if you had Kevin Hamilton in between, though. Yeah, I'm going to take Kevin, and then we'll come back to Luis. Okay. Oh, no, forget about Paula Toronto as well. Okay. I think Paula's up next. Yeah. yeah, we'll take Paula, then Kevin, and then we'll go back to Luis. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to comment on the, the, the process of identify, engage, and assess in the Chapter 5. I think one key thing that I wanted to comment for this process is in, in terms of our experience is how important it is to let the community come together on its own before jumping in the in the pool per se. Um, and like besides the technical assistance and the assessment, I think it's important to also add in here um, allowing communities to build their own organizing power building model um, in some ways, yes, education and training, but in a way that it, it builds trust among the communities and the co-leaders or the, the community-based organizations um, before entering a space with regulatory agencies. And I think that that's important to bring as a nuance in, in, in these dynamics because it's okay to for, for communities to have a different relationship with community-based organizations than with the districts. It, I, I think it's important to bring that nuance um, and to just uh, amplify and elevate how communities, the communities that do have community-based organizations working with them directly are deeply rooted in the history of those communities and that needs to be more amplified and. In, in such a way that when a community is selected and they have already built, have time to build their own power building model, then they're ready to, then they have a trusting model to then come and engage with the agencies as a whole. Um, and I think uh, in addition to that, um, it, it's what Ms. Margaret was saying about community science and community leadership. Um, I think that also needs to be part of the technical assessment and the technical uh, assistance of the chapter um, as the community is getting prepared for being selected. One thing is having a community air grant, but not having it is also an issue. So I think that gap needs to be addressed somehow um, to ensure that, that the communities have that time to, to be prepared for, for selection. Um, and then an, another thing is uh, how to uh, how to build within the, the guidelines of the, the blueprint, um, respecting the community's uh, engagement process, um, and how how uh, community based organizations have built that already. So and how that can be embedded in the process. Um, and so that's that's one thing. And then the last thing is based on um, building up on what uh, Luis Olmedo shared about resources. Uh, yes, the community air grants are important, but, but I mean, this, the CSC co-leadership models that have more than one community-based organization engaging, it's, it, the funds need to be um, continuing to funnel in, um, participation and engagement um, pre-selection. So, somewhere there in the pre-selection process that needs to be addressed. Um, again, for addressing the gap of those communities that do have a community air grant and those that don't. And so how do they build their own community um, uh, power building model? Um, yeah, and I, I think I wanted to, to just emphasize um, how important it is to, to let the community lead. Um, I keep looking at West Oakland's um, serve development in their process and I keep referencing it and I'm like I wish our South LA SERP was called our air or my air my health or something similar that we came up with in our um, air quality academy which was part of our community air grant process and it, it, there's a, just a little bit of disconnect there on how to better integrate the efforts that community-based organizations have um, implemented for many years into the into the CSC, into the selection process, into the implementation. So wanted to mention that. 
Thank you. Oh, Mindy, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry, thank you. Kevin, let's go to you. Okay. So uh, specific to the document, I, I do wanna say, I, I think this document's getting here, certainly uh, chapters five and six. Um, again, I support the comments colleagues had made uh, specific to activities within communities and as part of the sort of base building community organizing piece. What I think would be useful to have at the very beginning uh, of this particular chapter would be carved to create a, uh, we have a statewide definition. We have uh, 535 and 1550 to SB 535 and AB 1550 to I, let us know uh, what sort of connotates a community. But what we don't have is lists of the communities. So I think uh, a very useful first step is combining uh, census data, not in a respect that the census data is, is oh so wonderful and accurate, but it does list communities that uh, that have a population, even if it's under 100, still there's an estimated population. So there's a lot of names for communities on maps that are historical and uh, no one's lived there for 100 years or more that are just left over. So that could be very confusing looking at just a map and saying, oh, that community is in a, a EJ area that's affected by air pollution. So we need a little more resolution than that. But right now, it, it's almost like we're working to identify somebody who may be uh, some community-based organization that may be working in that area to work with uh, and help understand that this is available to them. When I say we're, I mean community-based organizations. Uh, and not meant as a knock, but I don't see any effort on the part of air agencies to go out and notify communities that they certainly realize could be eligible for selection uh, and would potentially meet the criteria and let them know uh, that they, they could have this asset. Now, you know, with some communities, uh, where they're not recognized as a city, then that can be a problem. But many of these communities are actual cities uh, with a governance structure. And so there needs to be some mechanism for communication to let them know that they could be eligible for this. And, uh, you know, would they like to participate? So right now it's, again, I keep using this word ad hoc and it pretty much is. So this needs to be a lot better defined and I think the keeper of that inventory and the developer of it would be uh, CARB and that this group could certainly provide uh, advice and, and feedback on a tool to, uh, to build that inventory. So that's, that's sort of a missing piece there. And then uh, an opening statement, you know, as to the intention of these two, I, I think it was, Luis, who made two really right on target comments. One was uh, the word intentional, and I use that with my staff all the time. We need to be intentional about what we do. And so making statements as to what we're wanting to accomplish with this particular uh, chapter, both of these chapters I think is critical and to have that statement for each chapter. And, and again, in your, opening you you try to do that a bit but it's you know it needs a lot of work to say the least so uh and then the other is uh the idea of being persistent and consistent about what we're doing and uh i'm just not quite seeing that yet as well but as uh, louise said make the ask so uh i'm making that ask we need an introductory paragraph and we need that inventory of communities so that we who are on the ground trying to, to find these communities that we're not already working with and make sure they're not left out, have some kind of guide to go by. Uh, maybe this isn't as important in the big concentrated population areas. Uh, I don't wanna suggest that, I'm just saying maybe, but I can tell you in the rural communities of the San Joaquin, uh, you know, this is really critical. 
So that's it. But thank you again. I, I think the document is, you know, from my, just my opinion is probably 70, 80% there. So. Thank you, Kevin. You're welcome. And I, I know we have more questions in the room, but we have somebody who I don't believe has spoken yet. So I want to open it up to a new voice, if that's okay. Of course. All right. Thank you. So Catherine, I'm going to go ahead and take you and then we'll go back to the room. Right, thank you so much, Mindy. Um, one of the things that uh, stands out in going through the blueprint and in the relationship that we have at South Coast with uh, our current community under development, and that is uh, South Los Angeles, mm -hmm. that fundamentally there's some things that uh, coming together um, and bridging the gap of agency and community is common agreements that may not be so common. <laughs> um, and fundamentally, and, and we, we heard, you know, Ms. Margaret mention at the beginning of the meeting, just a request for clarification on something that had very good intentions. Uh, but it strikes me that just a very fundamental uh, term that we've been using throughout the document and throughout the time that, you know, we work with communities, uh, requires some definition and that is capacity building. <laughs> so one on community capacity building, but also on agency capacity building. So what has come up in, in AQMD uh, going through or South Coast going through the document is what is the definition of capacity building? Again, community capacity building and agency capacity building. Because unless we have a shared common understanding of what that is from a fundamental perspective, we might be going along the same path, uh, believing that there is some, you know, uh, marching forward together to, you know, bridge the gaps. But unless we have a mutual common understanding of what that is fundamentally, uh, we might be continuing to talk, you know, at one another uh, versus to one another. And I'm, I'm really speaking from uh, a great deal of experience and progress that has happened with South LA. Uh, some of our biggest uh, movements have been at times when we stop, pause, and have conversations that really uh, create a space of listening. You know, that we've come to that space uh, uh, after having very challenging discussions uh, where it's apparent that coming together with varying expectations from the very beginning and continuing to hit difficult, you know, uh, uh, steps along the way, um, you know, we, we've created space to, you know, hear one another. And when that happens, progress is made and it, it does create a, a big sigh of relief to uh, finally understand things that have been tossed around, concepts that have been tossed around. Uh, but we've never taken the time to just go back and define them. So that's one of the things that I would ask, uh, you know, throughout the document uh, that we, that there be a clear definition of, again, the simplest of terms. Uh, perhaps there needs to be a, an appendix, uh, but just as, as the uh, air districts uh, use quite a bit of acronyms, you know, we do uh, have a list of appendices of what that is so that you know, community members can understand exactly what terms are being referred to. That's part of the educational piece. Um, so that's one thing I would ask, uh, suggest throughout the document. I know we're discussing chapters five and six, but that needs to occur throughout the document. Uh, and that is part of the educational piece so that we can have a common understanding uh, and so that we can move forward, not just community organizations, because we're finding that uh, the community organizations are, uh, they're advocating for uh, CSC members with our co-leads. Uh, however, you know, there, there's a gap. There's, there's gaps between the community and organizations, but there's also then the gaps between uh, agencies and, you know, co-leads in our case, and then also with community. So let's, let's take some time to make sure that there's a common understanding and perhaps there's some discussion that needs to take place on that term in particular, what is capacity building so that we can all again have that common understanding. 
Thank you, Catherine. And I just want to harken back to the conversation we had at our January meeting. This has come up before requesting having a glossary um, where there are definitions. And I think as part of that process, you just highlighted having some discussion on what those things mean so that there's shared agreement. So thank you for that. And I want to go back to the room now. So we have a Luis and then we have Christine Wolf. Thank you. Um, thank you. Go ahead. It's it's um, in everybody in the room I consider an expert in in air quality, whether it's firsthand lived experience, being frontline and constantly assaulted to sources that have not yet been addressed or controlled or or because you know you went and did the hard work of learning about it and then um, and you know because you're either scientist or attorney or, or have some uh, background experience and I, I really feel like I'm talking people really know the history and really understand what has been happening and I think it's really obvious that we all know that air districts and the state, I mean, I'm not cutting anybody any breaks, know very well that there have been political decisions made to respond to issues in some places and ignore other issues in other places, to allocate resources to some places and to not prioritize others. We know that we, the public, or I would say, let's say, you know, a, 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 uh, a step up from the individual, um, but let's say CBOs or NGOs or CBOs or, or environmental justice, uh, doesn't have the authority to go out and regulate, permit, or do um, updates on permitting uh, and all these methods and ways to level out the cost of regulating sources because the resources, the air resources are the public's resources, right? We have a right to breathe clean air and the Clean Air Act assures us that our legislators and our cardboard assures of that and boards and districts assure that. We know that, right? So we have a sort of a level of intelligence and knowledge and we know that air districts have always had far greater authority than they've actually exercised. And we know that CARB has far greater authority than it's exercised. Knowing that and putting more money on that, it's like they say, if you keep doing the same thing, you're going to get the same result. So who are the least likely? Well, actually, who are the most experienced on air quality impacts? It's the communities. It's the people that are working this issues frontline, and it's the people who are having to live with this burden, um, you know, their whole life, or, or um, whether it's their job, or, or whether it's because they grew up there. And I still see situations here with monitoring, where you're giving districts money to go out and do what they already do or what they should be doing. We're going to have the same outcome. We're going to look at things that the community is not asking for. And there's going to be political decisions. If we want to bring real equity and right the wrongs of the past, give community the resources. Communities can make phone calls. Communities can pick up the phone and, and look for consultants. No different. Absolutely not mm -hmm. one single difference than an air district does. Go out put an RFP or maybe, you know, get the support and technical assistance or maybe experience from air districts or CARB, or it can do it itself. You know, there's different levels of capacities and knowledge in communities. Go out, get community trusted consultants to work for the community and go out and move measurements on those issues that are priority of community. It's, it's sort of a false solution and I think we're all sort of adults in the room and know that, that that's what's been happening. And if we don't put language in here that puts that power back on communities to say, 
you're the least likely to have the resources to go out and get your own consultants, your own monitoring experts, right? If that doesn't happen and we don't intentionally put it in the language, we're gonna be giving back money to the districts that have always had the resources and power to go out and do that very thing that we're asking them to do, but here's more money to go do more of the same, right? Um, I mean, I can speak firsthand experience. You know, and we have lots of issues in the community, but we started having to play the game, right? Well, we don't wanna push the district too hard because we don't want them to just kind of get upset and, and fall out, right? We wanna keep them engaged. But at the same time, you know, communities are kind of forced to just sort of take what, you know, they're being given. So there's really no real driven um, effort at this point in California by any community, no matter how much we want to paint a rosy picture that 617 is giving communities the power, it is not. It's just giving more money to air districts and air districts are controlling it. Their boards are controlling it. CARB is not stepping up and saying, hey, you know, this authority of the clean air was given to us. So therefore districts, you know, you need to kind of fall in line and, and you know, we're here as uh, the authority, you know, it's the powers as, and I don't know if it's just perceived or real, but the district control all mobile sources. CARB controls, oh no, the opposite, all stationary and CARB is mobile source. That, that doesn't make any sense. 617 is never gonna work until we give community the power. I mean, we're out there. I mean, I remember 20 years ago out there with P-Tracks doing measurements. Now we're in another place. I mean, it was the work that we were doing in community that identified a failure in the regulatory monitors. Why can't communities be given those resources so they can call, make a phone call, pick up the phone. It is a relatively easy you know, type of technology that you can dial and call consultants and say, I want you to come out and work for me because these three major sources are really concerned and I want you to go out and measure them. And no, don't worry, you don't have to go through a board to approve that. You know, it doesn't have to be political. You know, you're, we're not gonna get lobbied, you know, so they can look the other way. No, this is straightforward source, concern, and then let's tackle that uh, issue. And I think the language, uh, I don't think it needs to be very clear here. We need to shift those dollars from air districts give them to communities. Because if we continue to give the districts the power to go out there and call their consultants and say, oh, you know, don't look over here, look over here in this other side. That's what's happening. I mean, I, I challenge any their district to say that, you know, they're doing something different that they're actually listening to in communities. But even in the best circumstances, which I feel that we are in Imperial, I feel like we have a great partnership and a great relationship. I really do. I really applaud them for what they're doing. But they're all they're measuring the the new river when we have all kinds of sources everywhere uh, that aren't going to be looked at. So what do we do? You know, it's not up to the community partners. It's up to the the air district. It's up to the county board. It's up to whatever they decide at the very end. And communities are still at the mercy of political decisions. So I would say that this is such a great opportunity again to to uh, give communities what it is that this was always intended to do. Let's put that power back in communities. I mean, you know, I keep hearing over and over and I'm pretty sure it's no secret. I mean, nobody wants to give districts more money. I mean, it has a power to go out there and, and you know, do a, a, an equity fix on and its permits and its regulations. So communities don't have that power. We can't go out there and make, you know, political decisions and say, hey, now you, you got to pay nonprofits to go out there and do this kind of work. We don't have that kind of power. Air districts do. Uh, I'm not saying that they don't need money. I'm not saying that they are rich in resources, but they certainly have a lot more than communities do. And this vehicle, this bill, was supposed to be an environmental justice bill. And this is such a great opportunity to do that. So some of the language here, I'm not sure if it was 100% contributed by environmental justice or if it's you know, um, contributed by, I'm not really sure, but hearing some of my colleagues here, it doesn't seem like it was all entirely put forward by environmental justice. Thank, Thank you. you, Luis, appreciate it. Uh, I, again, I wanna do a time check. We need to move on to public comment. Um, I did see that there was another comment in the room. Uh, so I wanna take that. Deldi, I saw your hand up, but uh, I don't see it now. Okay, so uh, do we have one more comment in the room, Brian? Can you just let me know? Yeah, we actually have two. We have Christine Wolf and then Paula Torado. 
Okay, let's take Christine, then Paula. I'm gonna turn facilitation over to Lisa, and then I would like us to transition to public comment. And if your hand is raised now, if you don't mean it to be raised, please lower it. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mindy. Um, I'm just wondering if CARB is able to give the consultation group either a report or a presentation on the activity that has been supported and some of the data that's been collected both pre and post designation, because I think that would be helpful data for us to have as we're looking forward towards um, funding needs in both the short term and the long term, um, as well as if CARB decides to go forward with a prioritization framework for designating communities, it'd be helpful to understand the, the data that um, has already been um, established to as we sort of react to those prioritization frameworks. I think that'd be helpful for the consultation group to have. And I don't know if CARB is already putting that together as part of the program blueprint update, but it'd be helpful to see that sooner rather than later. Thank you. We'll take that information request in now. Um, and we'll we'll get back to you either at the next meeting or, or via email unless Del, do you have a real quick answer? Um, just that we are working to finalize our program update memo. We hope to have that out in the next um, few weeks and we'll definitely make sure that the consultation group is aware of it. And we can also loop back for more specifics as well. Super, thanks Deldi. I think we have Paula and then we're gonna go to public comment on chapter five. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to just uh, build on what Luis was saying. He sparked my, uh, my thought processing around uh, giving the power back to the community. I think one, one thing that is also important in the pre-selection and post-selection process is building in understanding about the expectations of what 617 can actually accomplish and what it cannot. I think a lot of the organizing that happened or that that we built in South LA, built a lot of excitement within community members of what was possible of an air quality improvement plan. And th so then we enter the process and it's a lot of like, oh, we got to check with the legal team. We got to check. And, and I, I understand, right? It's, a, it's still a mandate, it's still a statue. Um, but that just puts into context the dynamics of what, what is actually community power when with, we're, we're developing actions for, for the SERP and, and then we're told, well, you know, this could still be shut down by the board or by the stationary resources committee. So then what happens next, right? So if, if we put in, in the SERP, um, explore a rule amendment and then we explore it and then nothing happens, then what do, how do we go back to the community? So I think in the pre-selection and post-selection process, there needs to be some sort of uh, very, very explicit of what can and cannot be done with 617 and what are the expectations um, and how to you know, be true and transparent to the community about that. Uh, because it's a lot of commitment, it's a lot of work for communities to engage in this process. And, and, and that's the least that 617 could do. And I think in addition to that, it's how to, um, so a lot, so, so for, for example, for the server development. So a lot of that technical assessment, technical analysis that is in the pre-selection and post-selection process should also be like, what has been done? As a co-leader in the South LA process, I shouldn't have to go to the West Oakland plan and be like, oh, these are great actions. Why does South LA doesn't have that? I want that. Or why does Wilmington have all of these actions? They're great. How come our language is not as good as the Wilmington plan? It feels like the technical assessment piece of the pre-selection process should include an assessment of what other communities that are similar to the community that is going to be selected has had what, and what can be relevant to the community. And I think that that should also be part of the, um, the, the process as well. Thank you. Thank you. Next comment in the room. Well, I think, I think we might be done with comments in the room. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Um, I do want to address something that was mentioned. I mentioned before that just due to the complexity of the webinar and the hybrid environment, we were not using the Q&A feature. 
Um, I, I think Brian might have actually mentioned that earlier. So I uh, just wanted to bring that up because there was a, a email that was sent asking about that. Uh, and so we'll keep revisiting that as we're moving forward, but that's the reason that we don't have it. Uh, and so thanks for Kevin for bringing that up. I appreciate that. Um, I want to turn to the public now. Uh, for members of the public, if you have a question or a comment that you'd like to make on Chapter 5, um, could you raise your hand? And then Liliana, I believe you're the one who's monitoring that. Is that correct or is that Adriana? I can help monitor that, yep. Okay, can you let me know how many folks' hands we have up? Well, we only have um, public attendees uh, virtually. We have... Uh, no public attendees in person. Right. Um, who's monitoring that online? I, I can't see. I have it up. Got it. Um, so Lily Wu's hand is up from Oiha. And um, go ahead, Lily. You should be able to talk now. And, and I just want to, before folks start, I, I know right now we only have two comments. Um, but just being mindful of the time, if it's at all possible for folks not to exceed two minutes, that'd be great. Um, so thank you for that, if you can do that. Lily, go ahead. Thank you for joining us. Actually, I see that she put her hand down. Um, if that was meant to go up, please raise it again. There it is. All right, I'm gonna allow you to talk. Um, yeah, I, there you go, Lily. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to introduce myself if I um, haven't already uh, had some name recognition. I have been working on AB 617 as a toxicologist with OEHA um, since September 2020, and I've engaged with some community members um, in, in different parts of the state that have the AB 617 designation. And to, just to uplift some of the um, comments that I have heard, uh, particularly uh, South Coast, uh, Karen, uh, sorry, Catherine Higgins, um, that, that point about capacity building, and then also, um, I apologize for not being able to attribute who said what, but the, the points about shared learning and, and collaborating to understand and not have to restart and reinvent the wheel um, over as new communities come on board or as lessons are learned, I think are particularly helpful points. And for the um, space that OEHA has to support the community health concerns, I think that that's particularly helpful as we, like many others, face capacity issues. But for the sake of retaining institutional knowledge, whether like community or agency, uh, local or, or state level, um, I think that, that those are good points to be able to um, uplift and hopefully embed into some of these processes. Thank you so much, Lily. Did we have other public comments? Yeah, we have Mary Valdemar um, from the San Bernardino Muscoy CSC um, Community Steering Committee. Uh, Mary, I've unmuted you. Go ahead. Yes, can you hear me? We this can. Thank you. Great. Um, I just wanted to take a, a couple of minutes to really uplift some of the comments that have been made uh, by the folks in the room. Um, and also really call, um, you know, I, I really, I want to do a, a light call out basically and, and, and really say like, you know, coming back and forth to our local steering committees and then to the card meetings, it is a very drastic tone difference in formality and rigidness and control of the room. And that is not something for local uh, CSCs that builds trust and in this conversation about equity. And the messages that I'm hearing about, you know, like the concerns about saying words like hyperlocal, the concerns about, uh, you know, uh, using a lot of consultants, the concerns about uh, agencies having resources, you know, and, and AB 617 funds going to agencies instead of going to direct communities, uh, you know, are super valid concerns that on top of some of the rigidness in, at, at some of the agency levels, you know, creates this, this, this uh, extractive, like a uh, going through the motions kind of feeling. When I read the blueprint, I read, you know, the words and the language that's there. Um, and it's very like on the surface, it looks good, but, when I come into spaces 
and I and I I like do a temperature check for the feel and the vibe in the room, you know, it doesn't feel inclusive. It doesn't feel um, you know, community centered. It doesn't feel um authentically uh focused on marginalized voices. And that's a concern. And I say this as someone who works in academia that also sees this happen in academia, right? Like there's a lot of, you know, school districts and other agencies that that have a similar model that have the best intentions about equity and inclusion and, you know, justice, social justice, environmental justice, you know, human rights and civil rights, but miss the mark because we're still using a format that feels very exclusionary to the community. And, and so it's like kind of like talking out of both sides of your mouth. And I just wanted to say that, and I, and I say that as like a kind, kind of like calling in type thing, you know, like, like I, I, I want to push that we let go of some of the control in these kind of, in these kind of discussions and, and, and let a dialogue happen that I think is inhibited by the, the process and the, the hyper procedures that, that we're using. Um, even like simple things like, the chat not being open, like, you know, and I know that it's about, um, you know, management of, of the agenda and keeping folks on time. Um, but there's always this, this push to prioritize efficiency over equity. And efficiency is not more important than equity. Equity is more important. And inclusion is more important. And, and so sometimes, you know, we need to let that little, that piece go. And we need to invest those dollars in communities uh, that might not look like they have, uh, someone said earlier, you know, the right consultants or access to the right things, but they do. The expertise is there and we need to trust that. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Liliana, do we have other public comments? Yes, we have Jasmine Martinez. from. Can Cuba. you let me know how many we have all together? Um, this is the last public comment um, hand up. Uh, Great, thank right. you. Thank you, Jasmine, welcome. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Jasmine, Martine, Jasmine Martinez, coordinator with Central Valley Air Quality Coalition, or CUAC. And throughout CARB's fourth annual selection process, we definitely saw the increasing tensions with communities and CARB um, as they sought out resources to alleviate their pollution burdens. And it has really highlighted the need for program expansion and scaling up of immediate protections and long-term investments for clean air and health equity. The practices we are developing for chapter five around planning and implementation should work to support selected communities, anticipate our new communities as best as we can and fundamentally work beyond this program to address air pollution in our non-selected communities. I support expanding on the draft the blueprints language surrounding the phase in of eligible communities and increased engagement with self recommended communities. I also strongly encourage CARPS do everything it can to foster empowerment of the local CSCs in leading the 617 process on the ground. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jasmine. And then just checking back in, does that conclude our public comments? Yes, it does. Okay. Um, so folks, I think, uh, in terms of taking a break, and if, if there's disagreement, you can just physically hold your hand and I can see it, but otherwise I'd like to just go ahead and uh, focus, continue to focus on chapter, move on to chapter six and focus on the discussion. Does that work for folks? Okay, so let's go ahead and do that and move on to the next slide. So again, I, I think we're just gonna skip to taking comments on chapter six, uh, chapter six, on uh, monitoring. Um, and so I'd like to just open it up for comments and uh, just would like to check in uh, board member Hertz, uh, excuse me, board member Hurt or uh, Dr. Bombs, if you had any opening comments before we begin. Well, I, I would just say there's much expertise in the room with the group. So let's dive in and go directly um, to comments around monitoring and modeling. I know it's an important piece. Thank you. And I agree. Let's do it. So I'd like to open the conversation up for comments on chapter six.
Are there any comments in the room, Brian? I'm not seeing any. I'm not the... seeing any yet. Yeah, none yet. Okay. So chapter six is on monitoring and modeling. It provides some general guidance around community air monitoring and modeling. Uh, we did have some deep dive questions that I'm happy to prompt the room with. I just wanna give folks, and I can, yeah, we could just take a look at the slides for a minute, but I wanna give folks a chance to collect their thoughts. Okay, and I see that we've got a question or a comment rather in the room. Let's go ahead and go to the room. Sure, we have some coming in now. We have uh, Paula first and then Luis. Great. Thanks, Brian. Um, so for chapter six, a few comments on, on the accessibility of monitoring data. And I think generally for this chapter, what's really important is to ensure that uh, the, the guidelines are targeting how can we get to community ownership to the data, no matter what kind of equipment the district is using. And, and somehow here address the inability or like that, that issue and that gap of, of using local sensors for regulatory action. I think that that's one of the biggest uh, issues of purple air monitors, p tracks. How do we continue to have this conversation and based on community leadership to use um, combined lived experiences, community data and regulatory agency data to get to regulatory action? I think that that's the purpose of the camp of combining all of those three things together um, to get to regulatory action. But I think it's also important for, in terms of the accessibility to the community air monitoring data. I think based on experience in South LA, uh, specifically Allen Co, there's a lot of issues about access to data, going through the uh, public records request. It takes forever to get data for the community to know what's going on. Uh, how do we sort of also address that in here that the, bu the bureaucracy of the process enables, um, yeah, just puts a barrier and a challenge for the community to understand um, the, the gravity of, uh, or the state of the air quality. Um, so I don't know if, if that's something that can be added in the camp for, to just take out public records requests if it's a community steering committee it shouldn't have to go through that process. It's lengthy and it's, it's uh, yeah, it, and it's not helpful. Um, and then the last thing is to ensure that the, the whatever technology districts are designing to use is also vetted by the community. I've, I've co it's come to my attention that new technologies are being tested or are being used by regulatory agencies. I'm just gonna speak specific, specifically in the South Coast and um, the community doesn't understand them, doesn't know them. And I think we need to know whether these are being used for regulatory action or not. Did the power would go well? Thank you. Thank you, Paula. So oh, I think, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone in here, did everyone lose their screens? No. We, remotely, we did not. Okay, I think the screen behind you went out. That's great since you don't need that. So okay. I think we're okay here. So, sorry about that, Mindy. And we do have two more. We have Luis. Miss Margaret and Jesse. Okay, so I saw, um, yeah, and then we've got Kevin here, and I saw Kevin's right. hand go up after Jesse. So we'll take it in the order that you have, and then we'll take Kevin. Cool, great. Oh, so let's go. Let's go with. Um, we have uh, Luis. Yeah, go for it. So the uh, comment that I have is the. Um, a few years back, um, we uh, the, well, there's a long history of um, government and community environmental justice led, uh, we call them um, environmental justice tours around communities that a lot of times led to opportunities to go out and do sampling. And, you know, and that one thing leads to the next and the next and the next. And here we are today with 617 and so much capacity, so much STEM opportunities, so much is happening in our communities. And uh, I really appreciate, you know, there's, while well, my comment previous, my seem sort of just jabs at the government, I, I don't intend to necessarily give, do that. I, but I think we live at a time that we just need to be sort of honest with each other. 
and be able to find the best path forward. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I've seen and still I feel the arrangement of this language still lends itself to is that I don't think everybody necessarily is moving, well, has the same vision. I mean, sadly, I still think that some people might see community monitoring as a threat instead of an asset. And I don't see why we need to limit communities to just low cost sensor technologies. Why can't communities be funded to rent high end equipment and procure experts to come into our community or learn how to build the capacities and expertise so that we are creating the types of jobs and transition into the future jobs that CARB has. I mean, you know, we know that if you're not a scientist, well, for the most part, if you're not a scientist and an engineer, you're never gonna work at CARB. So why not allow communities to begin to go, to build the capacity, have access to tools and be inspired to move into these jobs that a lot of people at some one point or another will retire and will need to be replaced. Um, you know, and, and the other part is, CARB institutionalized 14 elements, 14 planning elements. I can tell you 20 years of dealing with low cost sensor technologies and our best effort in the early years and still our efforts today, trying to put our data and our information to meet the regulatory agency standards is not easy, right? And in the past, it was even harder. I think it's getting better and better. So. A, we, we need to stop having regulatory or, or experts in this space within the regulatory agencies and I'll say within the control of CARB or even the air districts, if there's a way to assure that everyone in the agency is moving in the same direction, I think it would save a lot of money and it would save a lot of time for communities. Because if CARB has adopted 14 planning elements, but yet it's still spending an enormous amount of time and sending communities in a different direction, that at the end of the day, they're gonna have a basket full of data and information, and they're still gonna be scrutinized and say, well, your data is not good enough, or your data doesn't meet our standards, or your data you know, isn't gonna help inform, or your data point is so little and so small and so tiny, it doesn't really help us for doing anything. Why are we being led in that direction? We need to have safeguards so that because communities are spending their time, they're spending their own resources, plus yeah, those leveraged resources to these programs and other programs, but we can't be wasting time. And I think at some point, I would hope that the CARB Air Board and the leadership in CARB kind of sets their foot down and, and holds accountable those within the agencies that just know enough or just have enough power to undermine our communities. We need to expand the language to not only um, uh, have the agency be in its best behavior, and I, and I would include to the extent that this can be influential on air districts uh, to make sure that they are using the best available practices, putting communities in the strongest position so that when they're done, their, their effort is actually usable and meets those standards necessary, and that they are allowed to also uh, delve into the regulatory space or the high-end equipment. There is no reason why we need to keep communities, especially those communities that are far more advanced, keeping them at the low-cost sensor technologies. So, um, so I would definitely like to welcome, I, I would like to encourage my colleagues if you have language, but certainly I, I would try to contribute language to, to help strengthen that. And I would hope that it's not just on this, but that it's a standard or a, a practice and this is something the board can really help with because it doesn't just have to live in this document. It has to live within the agency and the institution. And I'm really pleased actually with research and, and, and the uh, R&D, Research and Development Division, because I seen them growing from 2017 when I think I was the first time I went before the board uh, and some of the board members in the room were there. Uh, and, and, you know, just bringing up to the attention that research and development is coming up with all these ideas, but isn't really responding or solving our community's problems. And I'm, you know, I'm gonna be the first to admit, I, I think they're moving in the right direction and they're in a better place. And, and, and um, you know, that's, 
That's what we want to see. I right? want to see real collaboration, real problem solving, and real growth with from our communities and a real partnership. So thank you. Thank you. Does that take us to Ms. Margaret now? Yes. Um, Ms. Margaret. I, um, let me start from a beginning of 18 years ago with West Oakland Environmental Indicators. We have been fortunate enough and pushing our environmental justice methodology of coordination and collaboration with the Bay Area Air Quality Project program management for over 18 years. We have had one director for that 18 years that we push full control inside, outside game for all those years. Who directed his staff from, from time to time based on the things that we want to leave to make the staff come and work with us, all right? Work with, not for, but work with on multiple projects around understanding air pollution inside West Oakland. That, so all, how many, how many air districts are in the state of California? It's not all equal. They have, don't all have the same intention. It's word intention. And they're not all open and honest about how they work with the communities who are complaining about the issue of air quality and those root causes of what's happening. I just so happened, my organization just so happened to have a director of the West of the Bay Area Air Quality District who was, with, was willing to sit at the table with us, walk with us, crawl with us through dealing with a targeted, a targeted facility, the Port of Oakland, and had his staff work with us. Also supported us when we wanted to do a truck traffic study brought his staff in, gave us money. We did a training of the staff, of the residents to do the county. So I'm just saying, until the air districts up and down the state feel, feel confident enough to be, want to build those relationships and those trust with those communities, you're gonna have the confusion and the conflict. That's number one. And none of that was built into this law called AB 6.7. The time, the space, the place to build on getting those conflicts, confusion, problem solving out the way before you jump into doing the actual monitoring or the action planning. It's because some of the staff, just remember, some of the staff don't know nothing about the community. They don't live in the community. They, don't, they just there for their job. But they got to be, they got to have to be a new transformation of this revolutionary process called AB 617. Until that happens, we're going to still always have these complaints about the different air districts. Air, because all the things, all, everything ends up back to the local process. CARB is not going to tell the air districts what to do. Let's get, let's get over that. It's not going to tell, they're not going to tell the agriculture people what to do. They're not going to tell the, the local government what to do. They ain't going to tell the county people what to do. They're not going to tell none of them what to do. So you have to be able to be, you're going to have to learn to be your own expert in these processes of how you want to get things done in your community. That's West Oakland environmental indicator story. And also we always had the support and use the research and data to push for it and being able to document it through community participatory process reports. That's our story. But we also made us made a seat at the table with that agency called Barry Air Quality and then let them leave. We didn't leave, they didn't leave. Because we wanted, because they knew, they they knew that. It was for their best interest to, to, to be engaged with us. Now, I'm going to say this here. Baby Hunters Point, City of Vallejo, Richmond, may not don't have the same type of relationship. They didn't go through the same kind of the inside game and the outside game. So 
But like I said, this is what's not, none of this stuff of how to build this relationship was part of this, this law. Until though that space and place and time is built, the office will continue to have these conflicts with the individual hair district. And also when you get down to your monitoring, who is a contractor, who is a consultant, all those different things. So those things are built in for the communities to be actually what it says, community driven. Thank you, Ms. Margaret. I think we go to Jesse now and then to Kevin. Is that right, Brian? Yeah, I think Jesse had to step out. So maybe you can go to Kevin and we can come back to Jesse. Sounds good. Kevin, to you. All right. I certainly want to echo the comments of my colleagues and being a little more specific here, let's see. So um, I've got several things here that I think needed to be inserted. Number one, I thought early on the comment from Paula regarding uh, ownership should not be lost. And I note a really nice bullet at the end of chapter five, uh, CSC ownership and authorship recommended co-author for SERP. Uh, if you substitute the word camp here for SERP and put it at the end of chapter six or wherever it needs to go, uh, I, would, uh, I would include it. Now, I will say in chapter five, it didn't use the word ownership with co-authorship. So I think it's critical to have those in both those places on both of these. And then um, the camp should be developed prior to the selection and purchase of air monitoring equipment. So in our experience, the air, and again, I go back to everybody was working off a document that is um, completely out of date and didn't provide guidance here. So kind of air districts, I think, went back to their normal approach of we buy the equipment, we're the experts. So in fact, they're no longer the only experts in this conversation, and there are quite a number of them, including academics and I believe our organization, Luis's organization, Ms. Margaret's organization, and others have become quite expert in this area. So uh, it, it's not rocket science, by the way. And so once the camp is developed, where those monitors are placed and what it is that they're trying to learn is critical. So in general, the air districts bought monitors that monitored everything and spent a lot of money. It was about $8 million, at least for ours. I don't know what the others spent, but regardless, uh, whereas you know maybe community is really focused at certain things that they want to know regarding that particular area or neighborhood. So uh, having the equipment ahead of time limits those choices or because they're so general in nature that that monitor, for instance, may not provide them uh, the information at the level of detail that they want. So I think that's critical. Uh, the other one is uh, real-time access for the data. Now, it, I see where it says the data would be on air now, and that, that's fine, AQV, excuse me. But I think we need to include that it would also be available on the air, any air district proprietary monitoring, air monitoring display software. So um, I, it, it's been interesting to me that while uh, I love the fact that our air district has put up a, a site, um, even they are having problems trying to figure out how to display the data from the monitors they purchased for AB 617. And not, not to mention the other uh, air monitoring work that's going on under 617. So I think we need to address that up front. If residents can't get to the data and have to wait like we do for the next CSC meeting or maybe two or three to get data for a period of time that's already history, uh, that's not good. That's not effective and that's not what residents want. They wanna see that data in real time so they can think about my kids are walking to school today. I'm gonna to work outside today. Whatever it happens to be, my asthma is going to be triggered if I don't protect myself today. Um, and right now the existing uh, camp air monitors are not available at that level. And, and certainly even when they're available, the data 
is not in a in a user friendly community friendly uh, display. So I think that's about it for me right now. I'm sure there would be more. Uh, I wish I'd had time. Sorry, I didn't have time to take a look at this in the last month. It's just been too crazy, and I was off for two weeks. So I I would have added all these things ahead of time, but I'm putting them in now. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that, Kevin. So Catherine, I see your hand up, and then let's go back to the room. Okay, hey, thank you. I wanted to offer some uh, comments for clarity purposes. So um, in chapter six, um, South Coast, we're recommending language that offers a little bit of more clarity on the purpose for measurements um, and modeling, and also broadening some of the definitions to be kind of uh, more inclusive of work that can be done to identify um, the levels of pollutant concerns and also that support CERP action. So for example, uh, providing some clarification that modeling can be done. Uh, there's different purposes for modeling uh, and it can be done can be done in order to meet the CSC input and request. Um, there's also terms in there that reference emissions measurements. Uh, so we recommend that that be changed to pollutant measurements uh, because that way we can include uh, that includes emissions measurements as well as measurements that determine levels of pollutants near facilities of interest as well as within the community. Um, so just, you know, clarifying, you know, um, the uses of, mon of, of monitoring that way as CSC members are reading the blueprint, we all again go back to having that common understanding of what the purpose is for, for measuring, so for mo monitoring. Um, the other thing is that uh, measurements modeling oftentimes does not, it's not the sole basis for regulatory action. Uh, so sometimes there's other actions that need to be incorporated, uh, you know, that are connected with our, our compliance or enforcement investigation that may lead to uh, regulatory action. But um, having that clarity is really important so that it's, it's understood that there are different purposes for monitoring. Thank you. And Jesse, you had a comment? I have several comments regarding air quality monitoring. Thank you. Community-based air quality monitor provides an excellent opportunity to establish internships so that we can have neighborhood, you know, academic and career development. This year, I've had six university students contact me to interview me. Three of them were, go or were specializing in environmental science and were getting into air quality. And I asked each one, have you ever gone out in the field with a handheld air quality monitor, any type? The answer was no. I asked them, have you ever gone to like a stationary type of air quality monitor? or a network, and they all said no. So if we have our, our minority ethnic low-income students now competing for a job in a job application or some type of other fellowship thing, and they fill out their application and somebody else fills out their application, and one can say, yes, I went out in the field with a, you know, with a university and got experience with a handheld monitor, or a stationary or a network, they get the job, they get the fellowship, they get the grant. So our students that grow up in our communities would never have that opportunity. But having community-based type air quality monitoring systems and stationary units there, they have that opportunity to learn. They get that hands-on experience so that you know they can be competitive in that fellowship, you know, in that job career world where you know they can say, I did that research in my community. So I'm happy I got to learn because now I'm benefiting my community as well. So that's one point there. Some community back, some community air quality monitors and networks can also be backups for data. So if there's like an earthquake, <laughs> if there's a tsunami at the Port of LA, my office is three miles from the Port of LA. So if everything gets knocked out, due to a tsunami, due to an earthquake at the Wilmington earthquake fault that's right there. 
and none of them are operating, we have ours operating. By the end of this year, under our AB 617 grant, we will have seven VOC monitors, and then we'll be expanding and have at least three or four PM monitors. So that is a public service and a data service that we can also provide. Another thing of concern is that oftentimes there are no local things by a state or, or federal or local regional agency. And so a good example, AQMD has no monitor at the Port of Los Angeles. And Port of Los Angeles has air quality monitors that they've set up. Well, guess what? When the COVID start, and all of a sudden we had 30, 40, 50 ships out there waiting in line to come in because of now this new increased import of cargo, the main sensor that was right there in the middle, the port turned it off. It was recording no data. And they deny that it wasn't intentional, but then why wasn't it fixed? Why wasn't it replaced? <laughs> you know, we lost all that local data that we could have had. Now, yes, regionally, some of those sensors and monitors picked it up. And yes, there was an increase, but we don't know what it was exactly in Wilmington, in San Pedro, in Carson, in West Long Beach, because we lost all that data. And the last word we heard from them a couple of months ago, oh, well, we're gonna, well, we're gonna do better. We're gonna buy some new ones and set it up and get it up and running again. Well, it's been like three, four months now and still no word. And even if they do get it and set it up, we've lost two years of data that we could have had. Another example where it's good to have our air quality monitors. One night I was woken up about one o'clock in the morning due to a noise come from the refinery. It was a summer day, so I had my bedroom window. And what the noise was is that the refinery was flaring. But when I looked out the window, I could not see no fire, no flame. Well, what had happened, according to, the, to, the, to them, after the fact, was that a pilot went out, which caused the flue gases to just tons and tons of it just to come out. But see, I reported it when it woke me up like at one o'clock in the morning. When the inspector, AKB inspector went there, they said, oh, well, we started tracking it like 1.30, 1.35. And that's when it came on. And when the, inspe when the inspector checked back with me, I said, no, it started at 1 a.m. <laughs> and they're lying to you saying it started at 1.35. So, you know, having a backup monitor again would have caught that. And if I hadn't, my ears hadn't picked it up and woken me up, I would never have known it. No one would have known it. And they would have got away with, you know, how many tons during that 35 minutes that we would have never been recorded and documented. We also have a big concern because California's air quality standards for PM, for example, it's based on 2.5 and 10. There have already been 100 plus university studies showing that exposure to ultrafine particles 1.0 is more dangerous than PM 2.5 and 10 because it's so small, it gets absorbed straight into your body, into your organs, okay? And so we've already brought up to CARB over the last several years in AQMD that we should have a PM 1.0 ultrafine standard. Well, everyone's listening and no one's doing anything. But our next step in terms of PM monitoring is looking towards us now purchasing an ultrafine uh, type monitor that can now be added to our PM and 10 so that we can record that data and then we can use that data to support our petitions and requests that California CARB adopt a new PM 1.0. And so those are some of the points regarding air quality monitoring that we have learned and we are suggesting that be also incorporated into this section. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Um, so Brian, I, uh, Kevin, is your, your hand is up, yes? Oh. And Brian, how many comments do we have in the room or how many folks yes, do we have to make comments? Up. Right now, I think we just have Luis in the queue. Okay, so just wanna do a time oh, check. No, and, and Ms. Actually, and Ms. Margaret. So Luis and Ms. Margaret here in the room. Okay, so I just wanna do a time check. Uh, we have public comments on chapter six. We have 20 minutes left in the meeting. So I wanna make sure we leave time for those public comments. 
Uh, it looks like we may have to move the discussion on the memo and the assessment uh, to a future meeting, because uh, I don't think we have time to accommodate that with the time we have left. Uh, so I'm just going to ask folks in the consultation group, if you don't mind, if you can keep your comments to a couple minutes so that we can make time for public comment. I hope that's okay. And thank you for your flexibility. Let's go to Kevin and then we'll go back to the room. So uh, this is a more general comment, specific, especially to these last two chapters. I note as far as participation, and please correct. Oh, I just see Ryan is now in the group. Prior to this, I'm, I'm just not seeing today at least the air district participation that we that's really critical and thank you for being here ryan even if it's toward the end uh participation here so i feel sometimes like we're sitting here talking to ourselves when it's all my colleagues from the ej community and a few others uh and you know it's really important that we have all the viewpoints here on both of these uh as often as possible and, and in order to make this thing work in the end so um, you know, not hearing from them, uh, it, it's really difficult to move forward. So I, I don't know if we've heard from them in writing on this, uh, but I didn't see any any letters forwarded or anything like that, especially on these two really critical chapters that both directly impact uh, regional and local county air districts. So, um, and then we've got a couple of folks from industry here as well, including uh, Wisp, I'd love to hear you know, again, their comments. Uh, we've heard a lot from us on the EJ side, which is appropriate, but it'd be great to hear them as well. So I feel like if we're not gonna have anybody from an air district at the meeting. I mean, why are, why are we holding the meeting at that point, to be quite honest with you, so. Thank you, Kevin. I, I do wanna say that um, Ryan was here at roll call and I've seen him in the meeting since the beginning. Uh, so I just wanna from an independent- okay, Sorry, I, I looked down the list. I didn't see SJV, APCD anywhere. Yeah. The two times I looked, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't there. I'm old, I don't always see everything. <laughs> I totally understand. I have a hard time keeping up with, with it myself. Uh, Ryan, I, I would like to go to you. You haven't spoken yet. Um, Deldi, did you wanna jump in? I just wanted to acknowledge also that we've had a lot of very constructive um, contributions from Catherine Higgins. Kevin and Catherine is with our South Coast Air District. Uh, Ryan, if good you'd to like know. to oh, go no, ahead, Kevin. But I, I did not know that. I said good to know, but I when I look down the panelist list, I'm looking for who they're associated with. Maybe we could start adding that in or something. Unless I know them uh, personally, then I just don't know that. So that would be really useful. Thank you. That's a good note about adding affiliation. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, so Ryan, if you'd like to go and then we'll go back to the room. Uh, I, I just really appreciate it. And definitely the uh, the conversation that's happening. And I appreciate Catherine, um, you know, sharing her, her uh, thoughts and, uh, you know, from uh, the South Coast perspective. And we definitely, you know, um, agree with the, uh, the things that she was saying in regards to, um, trying to come from a place of, of um, a common or universal understanding. And so um, definitely wanna, you know, the, the more that we can incorporate and understand what each other are saying, it's definitely gonna help, um, you know, in this process. And um, in regards to the, the, the two chapters, um, you know, definitely uh, is in a strong agreement with um, the comments that uh, have been made by uh, many today. And, um, you know, what I really appreciate is the um, looking towards best practices in the, the, the two chapters and looking to, to learn from the experiences from the, the steering committee members that uh, helped put this together and that they included some of those best practices as part of the, the, the people's blueprint. And, um, you know, I, 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 you know, the more that we can do that and focus on the best practices, um, and, and still give a lot of latitude and leeway for the individual community steering committees and, and try to avoid some of the, um, the potential for prescriptiveness and, and, and basically, um, you know, one of the things I've really appreciated in working with four different community steering committees is that they, they each have um, their own lived experiences and um, that's really helped form their desire for how their community steering committee process works. Um, and so um, just definitely want to make sure that we're, we continue to leave room for the, the individual steering committees to 
um, opportunity to, to develop what process is going to work best for them. And so that, uh, um, you know, I just wanted to, to share that and uh, appreciate uh, Kevin calling us out to, to, to be more participatory. But, you know, like I said, I think, um, you know, from our perspective, we were in agreement with um, much of what's been said today. So thanks. Thank you. I also, just to be fair, want to call out, uh, there was a comment made about Kathy. I'm a little slow on the acronym WISPA, uh, but she was also in the meeting from the beginning and she participated uh, earlier as well. So we're going to go to the room for comments. I want to ask if you can keep those really brief so we can have time for the public comments. Thank you. Great. We'll go uh, with Louise and then uh, to Miss Margaret. <laughs> Uh, I'll try to get through them quickly. Uh, on int in the introduction, I think that needs to be completely rewritten. The way it reads now, it kind of puts puts it back on community. And uh, I would uh, recommend um, changing the verbiage there. Uh, you know, air monitoring helps both community better understand pollution sources and impacts so they can effectively, so they can be effective in addressing air quality issues. I mean, if we have a partnership with the regulatory agency, and we help understand or identify source. I would I would expect that the regulatory the regulatory agency is going to be on that issue, right? The way it reads right now, it's almost like okay, we're going to help you identify where crime is happening, so that you community can help how you're going to solve that problem. So I would just caution that that language needs to be more um, direct, more intentional. Uh, I would utilize verbiage, like even on bullet number two, where it says track, investigate. I mean, government has all kinds of very decisive, very, very straightforward language. And that's the kind of language that needs to be used here. I mean, I don't, being part of the program, I, I don't want to feel like I, this is just like some kind of science project, bring your kid to school, bring your kid to, kid to your job kind of feeling. This needs to be very uh, direct, very decisive. And while there's opportunities for the community to be there, help inform, help participate, uh, when things are identified, it should never be left up to the community to, to have to be the one to solve that problem. Um, the other is in, uh, as you go down on the engagement community air monitoring, I think I've here put here a uh, CSC in the district work closely selecting contractor and outsource. The best model to use here, I'm going to say that is to give uh, the community environmental justice partner, let's say in the co-lead model, for example, or any other model. It, if you want to level the playing field, make it fair. Communities should have the same tools and resources and access to technical assistance and consultants. So I would say that the um, uh, implementation dollars need to be made available to the co-leads uh, to assure that as they bring in the environmental justice perspective, the community perspective, that they too will have a level playing field going into the uh, identification, prioritization, and being able to contribute language, because this has been really a lopsided uh, effort here, where communities basically come in empty handed, no tools on hand, while the other side comes in here with all the money and resources to pull in consultants and support. So I think that there's an opportunity there to change that. And the last thing I have here is modeling a half 617 process. I made a note here that says uh, academics, private sectors, uh, the comment I made earlier about uh, the high-end type of equipment, regulatory equipment, this happens all the time. Academics do it, private sector does it. There's no reason why CBOs um, couldn't also have access to high-end regulatory equipment and, and go you know, through that process of learning. Um, I don't think that there's a huge uh, difference between a CBO and environmental justice groups. There's, you know, there's different groups in many different places in terms of their capacities and knowledge. And I don't think that they should be uh, excluded not being able to operate at those levels. And the last thing is environmental justice co-leads should be assigned TA. Though I think I've already made that point. And that was up here for the recommendation types of monitoring equipment and so on and so on. Thanks. Communities definitely need to have their technical assistance and consultants and implementation dollars should be assigned. I mean, I think that we've reached that point in time the time is now, and this is a perfect opportunity to change that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Margaret. Um, I'd just like to add, uh, my earlier statement was more, more or less about until there is a parallel discussion about the air monitoring 
and modeling was that the parallel discussions also how to resolve these conflicts and confusion, especially with just about what uh, we just said. It has Thank to you. be a parallel. Somebody has to have the skill set to support how you have this balance of equity and inclusion between the all parties. And if it's not there, you're just going to keep having all these, the, all these tensional, these tensions that should not be happening because we all should be on the same page about saving lives. And somewhere, somehow, that this has to be built in. And it's not as, uh, I, I, it's, as respectively as we have worked to try to do this deep dive, it does not make sense unless there is a certain set of skills being developed to resolve some of these underlying issues uh, about money, power, and who gives what direction and have ownership of the data um, simultaneously. It has to, this has to happen if this is going to be a success in our communities. Thank you, Ms. Margaret. I'd like to open uh, open up to public comment. And Liliana, if you'd let me know how many folks we have in the queue. And I would ask folks to keep your comments as lean as possible um, so we can get everybody in. Our meeting does end at five. Currently, there are no um, hands up for public comment. OK, great. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'm just going to turn it over to um, I'm going to check in with the chairs right now and see if we have any comments. And then Liliana, let me know if anybody from the public raises their hand. Uh, so uh, board member Hurt, is, sure. there any, is there anything that you'd like to add before? I'll do next steps. Uh, let, let's go ahead and do next steps and then I'll let you guys both have the last word. So if we could pull up that slide for next steps, that'd be great. And then I'll go to you. Sorry about that switch. And Kevin, I'm guessing your hand is up from the last time. So if it is, if you go ahead and set that down, that'd be great. Okay, um, so our next steps, June 7th uh, is the next consultation group meeting. It's from one to four. Uh, please go ahead and review chapters seven and eight. Uh, meeting invitations for that meeting will follow. Uh, there was a comment made about the consulta uh, about the temporary work group for the charter. Uh, so keep, please go ahead and let Liliana know if you wanna participate in that. Um, and thank you so much. I'm gonna check back in with you, Liliana, to see if there was any public comments, any folks raising their hand there. Still no. Okay. So now I'm gonna turn it over to board member Hurt. Thank you, Mindy. And um, Dr. Balms, I didn't break the process. So uh, <laughs> I sat back and listened intently and took a ton of notes. I just wanna thank everybody for continuing um, to come to this table uh, for your community and working with us. I really appreciated hearing how we can be better um, and what things we can do, especially because I sit at this table with the air district hat as well as the CARB hat and then also a local elected had and just wondering how we kind of figure out the spider web of, of work that needs to be done. And, and I think we're getting there. I, I wanted to uplift one comment about the data being in the hands of the people and, and how we can work on that um, just as uh, CARB and the air districts really um, bringing focus to that space so people can feel empowered in their communities individually and, and starting that journey of figuring out how to just make their area uh, cleaner and, uh, and building back just a healthier community. So thank you all. And uh, I guess I'll turn it over to the chair, Dr. Balms. Well, first of all, first of all, um, uh, Davina, I really wanna thank you for um, your willingness to uh, chair this uh, important AB 617 consultation group meeting. I sh I'm sure it was both uh, meaningful to you and to our consultation group members. I, I think having dialogue with more board members other than me is a good thing, uh, especially somebody like you who uh, has been really part of this process before you even joined the board. Um, and I agree with you wholeheartedly 
about your uplift of making data available to the community. That's the intention of AB 197. It's also, I think, written into AB 617 that uh, the data that is generated from community monitoring be made available to the community to empower the community to uh, work for change, to reduce exposures. Um, so I think that's an important uplift and I'm glad you made it. And uh, we can work together at board meetings um, to make sure that that uh, happens. Um, so I, I again, I, I'm sorry to miss the discussion, most of the discussion on chapter five, but I was present for chapter six and I uh, really appreciate the uh, input from people who've been doing this for a long time, like Miss Margaret, uh, Luis, and uh, Kevin. Um, and I also thought Paula's comments were, uh, you know, on target. And I appreciate that it's, you know, it's a change of, of, of uh, business style uh, of operations for the air districts. And I appreciate the air districts that are working to uh, working with uh, the community steering committee uh, committees to, to try to make uh, data more available and to get and actually, to, as Kevin mentioned, to try to get the measurements that the community really care about. Uh, so I don't wanna take any more time. I look forward to our next meeting uh, on June 7th when I will be present. And Davina is welcome to participate if she wants as well. I'm happy to co-chair with her. <laughs> Thank you, consultation group. I think the discussion, the conversation has been very rich. Uh, thank you for participating. Thank you for coming prepared, having read the chapters. Uh, and have a wonderful meeting in June and a very productive year. Deldi, is there anything you want to jump in and say before we move on? We're going to miss you, Mindy, but you are just very near to us, very dear to us. Thank you for everything you've done to help us get this far. And let's make our June meeting even better. Let's really aim to be here in person together. As Mary Baldemar said, let's change the vibe, right? Um, let's reduce that gap between, um, you know, what our meeting, meetings feel like. Let's really have a dialogue. Thank you. And can we advance to the next slide? And I just want to give a shout out. The, the CARB team and um, my support team worked really, really hard to make this as seamless as possible. And I'm super impressed with how well it went. I hope you are too, but I am. Um, so I just wanna give a shout out to, uh, to the folks who, who made this possible. And I'm leaving you with a couple of inspiring quotes. Uh, one is cooperation is the thorough conviction that nobody can get there unless everybody gets there by Virginia Burden. And then that old goodie by Henry Ford coming together is a beginning, staying together is progress and working together is success. Thank you. It's been such an honor and a privilege to work with you. Have a wonderful one. Be well. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, Mindy. Thank you, Mindy. Thanks, Mindy.